Hello, everybody, and welcome to Seeds of Liberty podcast, episode 33. We're going to go with Jeremy for the Bipcut No Gov license. Yes, the Seeds of Liberty podcast is covered by the Bipcut No Gov license. This allows for reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information about this at bipcot.org. So today we have a, a recurring guest, Lou Fien from the Freedom Fiends radio show. Um, you can also find him, freedomfiends.com. Uh, his Facebook page is Campaign for a Longer Leash. So that's all he wants. He just wants a longer leash. And he's, on, he's on also uh, the, uh, an admin on the art of not being governed on Facebook. Um, so, so today we're going to talk about um, why incrementalism can't work. And, um, <laughs> and, other, and, and other minarchist mythologies. So, Lou, thanks a lot for coming back. Hey, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to finally speak with you and meet with you for the first time. I've talked to Dave and Jeremy a couple times in the past. I had a blast on here. I think you guys are doing great work. And you've had some pretty good guests on here, too. Yeah, yeah. actually, wait a minute. What, what happened to that? I thought we had a rule that Danilo wasn't allowed to talk to any of the fiends. What? Uh, oh, <laughs> never mind. Oh, we weren't supposed to say that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Never mind. About never that. mind. He's, Danilo said, fuck your rules. <laughs> yeah, we had Lawrence Reed on last uh, week. That was a really fun episode. And uh, now we have yeah. the uh, incomparable Lusander Fiend. <laughs> now, Danilo, I'm really glad that you brought up Campaign for a Longer Leash because it ties in really well with the topic tonight of incremental reduction in government is LOL. <laughs> basically yeah i was uh i was at a yow convention uh last weekend uh saw jeffrey tucker speak i saw a few friends there and i was talking to a, a kind of a libertarian party guy and i said you know think of it like this you know like what you're saying is like if you had a dog on a leash and the leash was only like a foot long and it was like right beside you what you're saying is that we should get like a 20 foot leash and then that'll be better i'm saying let's just let go of the leash and teach the dog how to not run away <laughs> Well, maybe the dog should run away. Oh, yeah, maybe it should run away. But, well, here, here's the question. Does it matter how long the leash is? If you're on a leash, are you free? No. All right. No. There, there's, no su there's no such thing as half free, sort of free, kind of free, am or free-ish. Am I on the International S Space Station? Because, I, I mean, if I'm on, a, on like, a spacewalk, I definitely want a leash. <laughs> Cause you don't want to go hurling off into space. I'm just, I'm just trying to throw a little. Well, yeah, but you're, well, Dave, you're still not, you're, you're still not, you're still not free in that scenario. So the, the, it still holds. Well, sometimes bitches need leashes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what? If you're in space and you, your life's on there by a leash, okay, I'm a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> no one wants to go hurling into nothingness. <laughs> Well, maybe yeah. there, there are some people out there that would prefer that over their current uh, living situation. And many of them probably should. I think it's a question of, um, you know, like, you know, when people say what percentage of taxation, you know, is not, um, you know, no way. How do you say, like, like if 0% taxation is complete freedom and 100% is complete chain slavery, what percentage is not slavery, right? And, you know, I would argue no percent, right? Because as long as you're forced even to pay, you know, a penny, <laughs> you're not free, basically, right? Because uh, that's an arbitrary that's an arbitrary amount and can be changed at will by our political masters. So, yeah, that the, there's no difference in kind. It, it, it's the same kind once once you hit that penny, or once you get a fraction of a penny, all the way up to a hundred percent. The only difference is in the degree. So, how bad are you getting? How how far is the tip going in, and where does the tip end and, and the shaft begin? <laughs> now we're getting philosophical. Now. <laughs> Campaign for a longer shaft. <laughs> <laughs> Campaign for a shorter shaft. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I told you guys I didn't get a whole lot of sleep yesterday before and after the show, so yeah, the the philosophy is going to get a little bit loopy here tonight. But anyway, so. The, the whole idea of incrementalism is that the government will systematically be taken down piece by piece, brick by brick, and eventually you're going to get to nothing. And this, this, this kind of ties into the, the subject of my last appearance on here was that pol libertarian political activism 
especially on the rare occasion that it works, is Keynesian in nature because it, it stimulates the demand for the state. Now, I, I've done something that I don't usually do, and I have jotted out some notes here. And the, the, the reason that I want to go into this with a bit of specificity is we have to look at exactly the mindset of the common status. It doesn't matter if it's the, the Ron Paul mini statist or the Bernie Sanders total statist. What you have to look at is the view of government. And for, for the average status out there, sometimes it's good. Usually it's legitimate. And legitimate, legitimacy is dependent upon which party's in there. So, of course, it's always a unconstitutional regime when it's the other party, but it's a, a gallant, noble administration when it's our party that's in there. Okay. And, and when it comes to the good, I, seriously, you, you can have one, a politician from one party do the same thing as a politician from the other party, and the, the definition of good is going to be based by you know, the, the members of the perspective respective parties yeah uh, I, I i saw a post the other day it was like it was a picture of like the front of the white house and there was like ten thousand people there and it was like this is what it would look like if romney bombed the hospital oh yeah 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 <laughs> the the anti-war left left but they weren't really anti-war they were an, they were anti-bush they were anti-republican um in the in the run-up to the 2012 uh clusterfuck <laughs> the, 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 cho the, the choices were Romney and Obama, and in, incidentally, for all these people that say, "Well, more people need to vote," when your when your choices are Romney and, are, and Obama, does it matter if another fifty million people cast a single sand, single grain of sand on the beach and tried to change it from the inside? No, we just have I'm... to vote moral people in, Lou, <laughs> to, to 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 captain this this entity of theft and, and coercion. <laughs> Yeah, because if you have moral people running theft and coercion, it, then it's not so immoral it's, anymore. It's, it's more efficient theft and coercion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was I was trying to pick up on what you were talking about last night on the fiends about the uh, uh, a good moral deputy or whatever. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's subjective. You know, probably the sheriff's idea of a of a moral deputy is somebody who goes out and harasses people for possession of agriculture, generates plenty of revenue, but is polite about it. Yeah. And does it and does it fairly? Does it doesn't cut anybody some slack because when they cut slack, that means that the laws are just arbitrary. But anyway, going back to the view of government, uh, for the for the common status, it's sometimes good, usually legitimate, but always, 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 always necessary. Mm -hmm. The same people that complain about Boehner and Pelosi, Reid and McConnell, Bush and Obama, whatever, they don't under. They are the mind that that America, the USSA, can survive in spite of these people, but it would just die like a rat and circle around the bowl and go down the drain without a Boehner or Pelosi, Reed and McConnell, or Bush or Obama. It is absolutely necessary that somebody be filling that spot, even if it's grade A losers. So you have that little disconnect there. Now, when it comes to incrementally reducing the state, because so many people believe that it is necessary, you have a number of people out there that, you know, like, let, let's go with the typical Theocon Tea Party socialist. If you have any type of reduction in military spending, war spending, they call it defense. If you have any reduction in drone, droning brown people in the Middle East, you know, getting them Muslims, you know, any pulling back from that is going to be the death of America because, of course, you know, the, the Muslim Navy is going to load up their ships and they're going to come <laughs> here and, and, and they're going to invade Florida. And the Air Force. and <laughs> Yeah, yeah, their Air Force. You know. <laughs> but you don't really have to worry about their Air Force because they can't land. <laughs> oh. Everybody, it's, it's been a number of years. But, but what you have is a number, of, a number of different fears. 
if you reduce the military, then the Muslims are going to take over, the Russians are going to take over, the Chinese are going to take over, or I don't know, Jamaica's going to take over. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> With, without, without a military, oh my God! You know? Rastafarians everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Funny smelling. They're cookies destroying our Christian so nation. Funny smelling cookies. <laughs> They're destroying our Christian nation. They're rotting it from the inside. The morals. We must enforce our morals through theft and coercion and the state. Yeah, but I mean that, that that's just one group. The the Theocon Tea Party Socialists. You know. The, the Christian Taliban, for the most part, American <laughs> Christian Taliban. <laughs> Let, let's look at the scared old little old ladies that think that if you have one less cop on the streets, all of the drug lords are going to start shooting up the place and killing everybody. And, and I just imagine if you have no cops, oh my God. People are going to freak out, and, and, and they're just going to – you're going to have drive-bys all over the place. You're going to have drive-bys until they run out of gas because, of course, no <laughs> gas is going to be refined because there's no government to say, hey, you, go take that oil, turn it into gas, and, <laughs> and, have, somebody drive it to, and have somebody drive it to the station. How, uh, where, would we, where, would we be, where would we be without fascism, Lou? I mean, it just – God, without the state planning everything, it just – you know – I don't think it could work, man. That's what they're saying, but they don't realize they're saying it. Right, right. Because I, mean, when, when when you talk about the war, you know the the drug wars, the turf wars, you know, especially like if we were having this conversation twenty years ago, and, and it's a scared old lady that lived during prohibition, and she saw that, you know. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe she was old enough to you know see what was going on before prohibition happened. But it, it's not the drugs that is causing the turf wars. It is the illicit market. It was the same way with the uh, with the alcohol prohibition. You had the gangland rubouts. You had the smuggling. You had the more powerful alcohol. Because if if you look at all the all the incentives that prohibition creates, it makes for a much more dangerous environment. But the the scared little old lady who you know can't have one less cop, let alone zero cops on the street, she's not buying that. You know, she she thinks that, well, the drugs make people kill people. No, they don't. Lou, Lou, you're not thinking about this correctly. Without alcohol prohibition, we wouldn't have bootlegging, and without bootlegging, we wouldn't have had NASCAR. So, or I don't the know. Kennedys. Was it? I think it was a good trade-off. We we ban alcohol for a little while, but we get NASCAR. You know, we get to watch fast cars go in a circle. I don't know. Yeah, it's called traffic. Yeah, yeah. it's it's uh, it's like you, a... you, you, you can go to any overpass and check it out, <laughs> and you, you get your crashes too. No, I uh, 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 uh there's one a of left our, turn. On one of our early... another left turn. <laughs> and another one. And another left turn. On one of our earlier um shows uh i i told the story about how walgreens became this huge huge corporation just from alcohol prohibition uh the year before alcohol was prohibited by the state of illinois uh they had 15 shops in chicago they went to 512 by the end of prohibition because they had a state uh granted um Medi a, medical alcohol license. yeah a medical alcohol license and they went to f from 12 to or 15 to 512 stores at the end of prohibition so just think of that one scribble on a paper what that did like that's that that gave that that regulation alone created that company so or, or it didn't create it but it, it it was the catalyst to make it you know the top five or ten companies in america you know that's how they made their bones yeah so like these un, it's the butterfly effect it's these unintended consequences of of state action that no one ever really thinks about just like nascar just now like i had never thought about that until you were talking about it i'm sure rednecks will have found a reason to drive really <laughs> fast <laughs> i you, you never put you know the the famous last words of any redneck is hey y'all watch this trust me i know <laughs> i've got an alabama hat on right now yeah yeah and, and all the redneck fairy tales started off with y'all ain't gonna believe this shit <laughs> 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 yeah, just about. <laughs> yeah, but 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 you make a very interesting point about unintended consequences, and Ludwig von Mises has a quote that I just absolutely love, and I'm about to butcher probably. 
Each new intervention is an attempt to deal with the unintended consequences of the previous interventions. Mm -hmm. So when, when you look at the playbook for handling things, and, and the playbook for government is always very small. Um, <laughs> they, they, they find new ways to do the same old thing. Um, when it comes to you know, a, a major crime spree, let's say you have a lot of drug violence going on in the neighborhood. Um, of, of course, the answer is always to crack down and, and put more cops out there and maybe arrest a few more people. And it, it goes in a couple of different directions. It, it might push people from one set of buildings over to another set of buildings until the cops get wise a month or two later. But it, it doesn't actually stop the drug trade. It doesn't actually stop the violence. It, it might curtail it a little bit. It might hamper it. Um, I was listening to Tom Woods talk about uh, talk about it was somewhere out in California. I can't remember. Maybe Los Angeles area. But anyway, uh, the the cops did this massive sting operation. They they did a lot of surveillance and research, and they were acting like acting like the CIA, gathering intel, and they swooped in and grabbed all these guys up. Boom! The entire heroin trade gone, locked in jail. Two or three days later. The heroin trade is right back where it was, maybe even a little bit stronger. <laughs> the only difference is the cops had no idea who was selling it now. Yeah, yeah. So the so the so this playbook of well, we got to get in there, we got to crack down, and we got to do this, and we got to do that. You now it it's it, it's really nonsensical. It's the true definition of insanity of doing the same thing over and over again. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a self licking ice cream cone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's all. When it, when the state goes, hey, we have a problem, or, or like schools, for instance. Oh, we need to. We everyone's got to get educated. Oh, state schools suck ass. So, oh, they just need more money next year. Oh, test scores are going down. Let's make the test easier and give them more money. Oh, next year, same thing over and over, rinse and repeat. Oh, we've got bureaucrats in our teachers' unions now. It's <laughs> it's just a big joke. The whole thing. It's like, oh, we need more money. You know. Was it a few weeks ago I said $18,000 per student in Baltimore? Per student in Baltimore, $18,000 a semester. Yeah. Not, and, a, and not a year, a semester. Oh, wow. So and ma Amazingly, the results mirror idiocracy. At, it may be a year. I don't it know. probably more than it costs to make the whole movie per student. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, you could take every student in Baltimore City Schools and instead of spending $18,000, like, I don't know, fucking buy them an iPad and say have fun. You say <laughs> insurmountable amount of money there, but you know these teacher unions ain't gonna let that happen. They they have this boondoggle that they their livelihood depends upon, and that's the problem with government. So this incrementalism, trying to take steps to do, to to reduce the activity of the state in normal day citizens' lives, is ridiculous because they're never gonna let go of any boondoggle they set up. Alaska had an, a surplus, and instead of giving the tax money back to people, they built the fucking bridge that goes to nowhere. It goes to the middle of the ocean. They're just like, hey, we ran out of money for this bridge. Let's just stop. Is it not like... even a round trip? No, yeah. it just goes, you got to turn around at the end of the bridge and go right back. So <laughs> It'll bridge... end up in Russia eventually, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Fascism for the future. <laughs> well, the, the the I mean, I mean, Dave, like you said, I mean, the 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 people in power and the people who are benefiting this obviously do not want to let go of that. Um, but the average status, they they have the thinking backwards because that's exactly what the people in power and the people who are benefiting off this want them to think. They look at they look at a problem and see government as the solution versus looking past you know be, before that to see that most of the time government created the problem that they're now wanting to fix and continuing to throw more money at it is just going to make the problem worse because it's not the it's not the matter that they don't have enough it's the it's the fact that they're the only game in town and when you do that you know you necessarily have no incentive to actually provide a good product at a, at a you know at a, at a good for you know at a, at a good cost because where are they going to go? <laughs> well, you you also have to look at the central planning of trying to create the the one size fits all standards for however many kids it is across across the USSA, fifty million, maybe up to a hundred million. Who knows? Yeah, I, sure. There's a lot of them, but um, 
Yeah, I'm re- I'm really glad that you brought up the teachers unions. I just started watching this new documentary documentary series is called House of Cards. Are you familiar mm-hmm. with it? <laughs> is it on? Is it? Is it you talking about the Netflix show? Yeah, yeah, it's a oh, documentary. It's, it's so great. I love yeah. that show. And, I, and, I watched a little bit. Yeah, in, in the first season of it, they have and spoiler alert, trigger warning, spoiler alert. Uh, <laughs> we don't do trigger warnings on here except for Danilo Soul Patch. So, <laughs> <laughs> Danilo, tell us where Rand Paul's tip touched you. <laughs> Can you show us on the doll? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, right. He's a two time Obama good... voter, okay? He would never vote for Rand. Uh, one soul... time. No, 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 no. One time. I got to correct oh, you. Okay. One, t- one, one time. Okay, man. One is what enough. does that mean? Is it if you have sex with like a prostitute? What's the difference between one and two? You know, <laughs> honestly, like you had sex with a prostitute, the rest is just semantics. percentages wise. I'd say, what's what? the difference? Syphilis, maybe. What, what, <laughs> what's the difference? Depending upon the depending upon how they look, seventy five dollars to start. <laughs> that too. <laughs> But yeah, that the, the soul patch would be the landing strip. But anyway, uh, <laughs> oh lord, yeah. In, in... Damn, oh, God. sorry, there our, sorry, there goes, Jimmy. There goes our family rating. <laughs> <laughs> it went away as soon as, as as as. Never mind. Oh god. <laughs> by the time by the time this thing gets edited, it is going to be as jumpy as a pornographic GIF on Tumblr. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, Tumblr. Anyways. Yeah, shit. Tumblr says so. Anyway. Uh, in in the very first season of, the, of that show, they're trying to get a new education bill going through. Well, first of all, you have a brand new president, and he has to go do some fancy stuff in 100 days, and he wants to get an education bill in there. He wants to get some education reform going on. Now, keep in mind that everything that's being reformed, you now, and, and this is one of Lawrence Reed's things, you know, everything that's being reformed is is just or the constant need for reform is just proof that the status got it wrong the first 50 times that they tried it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or if you or if you look at education reform on the federal level um what you see today is a result of about 40 years of reforms because that's how long the department of education has been around about 40 years something like that yeah but anyway so they're, they're trying to get this education reform bill going through and of course the unions for the for the government schools, government indoctrination gulag, they don't want the funding to go to charter schools. They want the funding to go to their schools. Go figure. Uh, they also ha- they also want the the testing standards to be every five years instead of every three years, because I don't know why. Maybe if uh, it, maybe if they have to justify their existence every three years, it makes it harder to loot. But uh, essentially, what you're looking at in the show and from what I know of politics, having spent a little time on the inside, is very realistic. It is, I essentially, it's like somebody took the took a whole bunch of food, threw it in a trough, and the piggies are going like they're never going to eat again. They're trying to get their <laughs> last meal, and that's what happens. So you got everybody trying to do this, trying to do that, and essentially everybody's trying to get their piece of the pie. Is is what it is, or they're trying to fill their bellies at the at the trough, and hopefully not turn into bacon afterwards. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's one of the problems with, uh, with democracy, because um, you know it's like the tragedy of the commons, right? Because you're you're only well, I guess the elected officials are only in there for you know four years or six years, and then they're gone, so they're going to be, uh, you know, spend as much money, give as much free stuff as possible, right? And mm-hmm. they, by the time they're gone, they don't care about any debts or any accountability or or you know. Um, any kind of responsibility whatsoever, you know. So, well, well here's something else to think about in that regard: the 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 common person, the voter. I mean, er, er, it doesn't matter who you are; you only have one vote when it comes to the ballots. Now, of, of course, it doesn't matter really who votes; it matters who counts the votes a, a lot more. But um, the the common man is bought off with crumbs from the fancy croissants that are going to the politically connected elites and, and when I say politically connected elites I'm not talking about the new world order reptoids and Illuminati all, all that other nonsense bullshit <laughs> yeah. it, I mean, it, it is a fact that the wealthy the ones who attain their wealth and maintain their wealth through the grant of the state you know the political entrepreneurs those that use the political means essentially tax eaters Donald Trump's 
guys like that. Those that if they weren't on, on corporate welfare, they'd probably be on regular welfare. Yeah, those are the ones I'm talking about. Those are the ones that get the fancy brooch and the croissants and, and the jelly donuts. Meanwhile, the common person gets a crumb and they think that they're having a feast. So they, they literally get bought off with a tiny portion of their own money while the vast majority of it goes to, you know, some, you know, tax-eating whore. Yeah, well, yeah. that's... Solyndra. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that, and again, and but that everybody and the same on the same token, you know, back to what I was saying earlier about how they have it backwards. They, you know, these people see that backwards as well because they look at the corporations and think it's oh, it's the evil corporations, it's these people. You know, they don't see the fact that you know, no, the government created it, they propped it up, and uh, that's why they're able to do this now, and that's why they're able to have these things. But they just they they. If they, they, their focus is always in the wrong place. And again, like I said, that's, I, that's by design. Um, you know, I, um, for me, I, I mean, I, the whole thing with incrementalism, though, um, I don't know. I mean, it, it's hard to say. I mean, would lessening the tyranny in certain areas be, you know, preferable to not having it do, done so? Yes, of course. Um, but on the whole, no, it would it wouldn't. But well, we'll get to that later. Go ahead, okay. go ahead and give your thing. Well, well, I was just gonna, I was gonna say, I was gonna say in the interim. <laughs> I don't know, I, I could see it possibly, but for me, I, I look at it as, I look at it as a, as a negative for what it can do for those people that are, that think they're liberty minded, that think they're about freedom. You know, a lot of those, the same. You know, the the Teocons, You know, the the, the Teocons you were talking about before. Um, mm -hmm. Those folks, um, people that may be closer to the conservatarians. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Any of those people. Um, it actually having the system, quote unquote, work um, is actually is, I think, is a net negative for us because that that just gives them more power to say, OK, great. Look, see, it worked. It, it, we got more freedom this way, um, which, again, is, is, is saying that you can have freedom without actually being free. You know, the whole the whole idea, oh, we're, we're the freest country in the world because we're freer than the other guy. Not that we're free, we're just freer. And that means, you know, and people just accept that as, as good enough. And that, that means freedom. Limited, like, like I said, like I say about everything collectivist, limited government, communism, socialism, whatever, all right? All of that is lies that fascists sell. You look at every one of the founding fathers, every one of them had a business stake in this becoming a country. All right, that it, they're fascist. <laughs> Every one of them, most of them own slaves. Mm -hmm. So this yep, whole yep. thing, this whole thing with this sitting here wanting uh, to try to play into a system that always gets co-opted by fascism is to me just so uh, lacking of critical thought. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's like the people that say, well, without the schools, nobody would, you know, nobody would know how to read and write, yet they ignore how, how a baby learns how to walk and talk without a government school. And if, children, if babies were taken at childbirth and then handed back to their parents, that eventually they'd think that the, the babies won't learn be, wouldn't be able to learn how to walk and talk without a government infant w training program. William Shakespeare <laughs> quit school at eight years old. Delinquent. Yeah. So, what the fuck does that? He cre he created the modern English language. Yeah. So like, how, these people don't think they they just spew what they've been told. Yeah, and 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 there really is no, no no critical thought whatsoever. There's no original thought in there. There's there's no examining what they believe. Um, I I think you guys may have heard me on Disassociation Nation. Uh, about a week or so ago, and I was I was really trying to nail this home that you know, most people are just repeaters, and and they they spout off these slogans, talking points, and other useless nonsense. And if they examined it with any type of critical thought, if they interrogated their beliefs, if they interrogated what they're being told, they would realize that a lot of it is just bullshit. I mean, would as as a example, back during the 2012 election cycle. Uh, the the choices were Romney and Obama, and I pointed out to some of these so-called conservative Republicans, these small government conservative Republicans, you know, they're they're, they're complaining about 
Obama's going to so or Obama socialized medicine across the U.S. Well, what did Romney do? You know, with with uh, Romney Care in Massachusetts. Well, that's at the state level. Oh, okay. So socialism is fine if you deliver it at the state level, but when you do it at the national level, for some reason, socialism just isn't so great anymore. <laughs> and I, they, they they did these mental gymnastics to defend Romney, and the only reason that they were defending Romney was because he was not Obama. You know, maybe it was because he was running as a Republican. Maybe it was because he just wasn't Obama. Maybe it was because they don't mind socialism when it comes from a so-called Republican. And and they and they actually believe that there's a difference between the two parties. And I, I think we're at a point right now where the candidates are so interchangeable, they shouldn't even have parties anymore. Oh, exactly. You look at uh, uh, there were all these posts. It was like, uh, shouldn't Hillary be on the the Republican stage right now? Like all her stuff sounds like a neocon. <laughs> yeah. Well, the fiscal conservatives are really supporting her because if she's president, they could save a lot of money by paying her 78% of what they'd have to pay a male president. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, you want to melt the conservatives, you, you want to melt the conservatives brain, ask them if they're for a world government. And then they're obviously going to say no. And then say, well, that's what the constitution is a prototype for. Like a war, one world government, like under the pretext that the constitution was made, you can make the same thing for the whole world. Yeah. I, when you look at the arguments that are given for the, for the Constitution, and especially today, uh, the, the defenders of the Constitution, the, the ones that say that the Constitution limits government and it protects state rights, but when you compare it to the Articles of Confederation, the, which was the states, and then you had these, this loose confederation, this federal government that was more like a more like a, I don't know, what would you call it? Uh, more like a get together and discuss things, but you know, no real power. And their complaint about that is, well, the states had too much power, the states had too many rights, and the government was too limited. So they grew government so they would be limited just right. <laughs> and quite frank, quite frankly, if you read, if you actually read the Constitution, which is something that the Tea Party socialists don't do, or the campaign for a tiny bit more liberty, folks, most of them have never even read the the Constitution outside of the Bill of Rights. They're like, I, I read the Constitution, all ten amendments. Well, if you <laughs> actually, if you actually read that, and you say that it limits government, the the question is, what are the specific constitutional limits on taxation? Specifically, what can be taxed? What can't be taxed? How much can be taxed? Is there a dollar amount? Is there a percentage of the actual cost? What is it? And, and there are no such limitations. Same with the national debt. I mean, there's, there's no limitations on national debt. So when you say you want to get back to the Constitution, it means that you want to be taxed and you want to be put on the hook to pay a mortgage for a house you don't get to live in. You know, how right. much how much can the federal government interfere with commerce because the interfering with commerce clause that's in there and 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 then you have that very specific enumerated power of doing what is necessary and proper to create a big giant freaking leviathan empire so how does that limit government i mean, it, the, the constitution doesn't limit government indeed and it certainly doesn't limit it in a word i mean, the, the constitution limits government like get well cards cure cancer <laughs> and it's, and the, <laughs> I just got it. <laughs> I, I had something I wanted to say, and then I heard it. Um, uh, that's ne funny. Next, uh, next, next time I'll I'll give you a trigger warning over instant messenger. <laughs> uh, no, it's so um, funny. The Constitution is so contradictory. It's like the citizens have a right to overthrow a tyrannical U.S. government, but the government also has the right to what is it? Dispel or um. Um, repel any insurrection? Uh, the, the privilege, the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless in time of domestic rebellion or foreign invasion or something to that effect. I may have, I may have gotten a word or two botched up, but I, that, that's the whole spirit of it. So, yeah, that's, that's actually the groundwork for NDA 2012, the indefinite detention provision. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, granted, the Declaration of Independence 
independence, which says, you know, if a government turns into a bunch of assholes, it's right of the people to alter or abolish it. Uh, that That is the very first law that is entered in the Federal Register. But if you were to lead a rebellion or something like that, and you tried using that as your legal defense and say, you know, hey, here's my magic words. You must let me go now. Uh, <laughs> It won't happen. <laughs> it won't happen. You'd be marked an enemy of the state and propagandized against and probably yeah. drone bombed in the middle of the night. Yeah, in your jail cell. Yeah. Yes. Um, so. the, the Liberty Hangout, uh, the guy we, we interviewed uh, a couple of times, a couple episodes ago, he wrote an article for his website called uh, Why Politics is a Waste of Time. And it's a great article, and uh, and basically talking about how you know if Harriet Tubman, imagine if Harriet Tubman instead of you know doing the Underground Railroad and you know illegally uh, freeing the slaves, you know, had, imagine had she written. she's like, you know what, people's like, stop breaking the law, and you know, vote, <laughs> petition your congressman, right, right, right your congressman, <laughs> <laughs> or or why don't you go into you know join government and change, <laughs> or what about Schindler, right, instead of <laughs> instead of uh, you know smuggling out the Jews the way he did, you know, he stop breaking the law, maybe maybe join join the Nazis and become an, a, a different, <laughs> maybe compete with Hitler, and change it from change the Holocaust from the inside. <laughs> Yeah, kind, kindly, you know. gentler Nazis. Yeah. <laughs> As a matter of fact, Harriet Tubman should have put down her railroad ties, and she, and she should have marched around the Capitol waving the government's flags, screaming, free my people, free my people. <laughs> and, and, and you know something else? For the Aztecs, if, if you don't like human sacrifice, why don't you just become a virgin and change the volcano from the inside? <laughs> Yeah, I hate when uh, when people say, well, what are you doing? Why don't you run for office and get in there? And ch I'm like, how do these politicians get paid? Eh, well, from your taxes, okay. Do you pay your taxes voluntarily? No. Okay, so why would I go work for this institution, this this essentially corporation? Why would I go work for this when, when they steal money to fund themselves? That that like That's like saying, go join... Blackbeard's pirate crew and change it from the inside. No, you're still a fucking pirate and you're going to be treated as one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but going back to the uh, going back to the what I said about the view of government, uh, most people think that it's sometimes good, usually legitimate, but always necessary. They will rationalize that because the Constitution, that thing that they never signed nor read. Um, is legitimate because a bunch of old dead people got together and, and violated their their mandate to only tweak the Articles of Confederation. So they're going to say that, well, that's legitimate, you know, because it's in the Constitution. And because they their adherence to the religion of statism and the Constitution is their holy scripture, they expect you to worship at the altar of statism also. And then, of course, you know, they go with the you know, well, it's necessary. You know, what about the roads? You know, well, when, when you say who would build the roads or how would this happen, you know, you, you're not, a, you're arguing from necessity or, or something else. But I mean, you're definitely not defending the idea that taxation is not theft. You know, you're just diverting from it. It's kind of like when somebody says, well, why don't you, why don't you leave and go live in another country? Well, okay. All right. What you're saying is, people who want freedom, they can't be here. You don't want you don't want that here, and you're completely deflecting upon you know upon the fact that that people are complaining about something specific. Like if if I say, you know what, I can't stand the police state. I can't stand the revenue generation, the road piracy, the harassing people that have, haven't armed other people, and they say, well, why don't you move to Somalia? Okay. Well, you're just ignoring what I what my actual complaint is, and it's a legitimate complaint. But they say, you know, well, it's the law, it's legal, which is the intellectual equivalent of saying because government said so. But mm -hmm. they're also the ones that claim to hate government. Yeah, slavery was legal. <laughs> the Holocaust was legal. Harboring, yeah. escapes, harboring escaped slaves was illegal. Well, yeah, and, you know, uh, you know, uh, Martin Luther King got killed by the government, and the government is uh, exists legally, so they legally killed Martin Luther King. And somehow had to pay money to his family. That makes but, no sense. But you have to remember that we are the government, so he didn't really get murdered. He killed himself. He committed suicide. <laughs> yeah, just, you're right. Just I like the, just like those folks at Waco. Exactly. I, I keep forgetting about the that that whole "we the people" thing. 
You know, it's so funny. It's it's uh, the the conservatives, the the smaller government people, the the mini statist, uh, as I've taken from you because I love that so much more than the minarchist. But <laughs> the mini statist, uh, you know, they they say, oh, it's the, if we could just get back to the Constitution, it's not happening. That's why I tell them it's not happening. You don't have the money for that to happen. <laughs> and it wouldn't happen if you had that money because you wouldn't want it. You would want you would want a more Leviathan state to protect your money. So what if the Constitution is this holy piece of document? Is Russia's Constitution a holy piece of document? Is Japan's Constitution is 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 North Korea's is is well, Iran's? Considering that the Soviet Constitution was based very much on the American Constitution, yeah. And the North Korean Constitution has a has a Bill of Rights in it. It's Chapter Five, Article Sixty Seven, guarantees uh, free speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly and demonstration. <laughs> chapter or uh, Article Sixty Eight guarantees free wish, freedom of religion. So yeah, I mean, granted they put it into two different articles, but that covers the First Amendment. Here's how ridiculous things have gotten, Lou. Vladimir Putin just legalized private gun ownership for self-defense in Russia. All right? That 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 didn't happen since the Bolshevik revolution. They took everyone's guns away, okay? We now have Hillary Clinton, <coughs> a war criminal, running for president, saying that gun confiscation is something that we might have to look into. Well, it's not really confiscation. It, you know, what, what, just, just as long as you... It's only confiscation if you don't participate in the mandatory buyback. <laughs> yeah, but but how how are Amer why, when are Americans going to wake the fuck up? Like, sorry to play this collectivist card here, but when are when are Americans going to wake the fuck up and realize that maybe America is the shit lord of the fucking uh, world right now? They're not, <clears throat> and and quite frankly, Americans have had it a lot easier than probably what we should have had. I, when was the last time that there was actually a battle fought on U.S. soil? I not, not civil war. Yeah, yeah. So I'm probably not not, not during our lifetimes. I, as a matter of fact, Pearl Harbor was even U.S. soil at the time. But I, that was even a battle. That was just a, a simple attack. You know, it was oh. it was a it was a limited airstrike with no boots on the ground. When, well, when was it? Was it <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry, when, but when, if, when was when was the last of the Indian genocides? The late 1800s, the late uh, 1800s, early 1900s. Could oh. be early 1900s, but I, that, that, you, that that would be the last one. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm not trying to go social justice warrior here, but you look at the things that are common to people across the world. Maybe not so much Western Europe or Central Europe, but definitely uh, the the third world nations. When when you're worried about you know, where meals are going to come from, and, and, and not because your food stamp card didn't get charged, you know, it, it didn't get reloaded with money. You know, it's where in the hell is the food going to come from? There is no food. So I, when, when you look at a lot of the things that, that people around the world have faced and the lack of adversity that even the poorest of Americans have, have you know, not had to deal with, it, it does make a soft, entitled crowd. So, like the the hard the hard things that that I tell conservatives is, if you think somebody's going to go in there, if you think Rand Paul's going to go in there, go, hey, we've got to turn off this water spout called Social Security. We've got to turn off this water spout called Medicaid. We can't pay for it anymore. Like that's not going to happen. That will never happen. They're, the the American government, just like the Roman Empire, just like Britain, they're just going to keep printing the money. Until utter collapse and then a shrinkage. Mm -hmm. I mean, if going back to 2012 again, if you look at the Ryan plan, uh, Paul Ryan, the Republican mm. vice presidential candidate, Eddie Munster with his widow <laughs> speak, he came up with this plan, this this budget, and there were no cuts to it. Everything was going to be more than it was last year. They, he promised to cut the planned increase amount so what he promised was to right. not grow it as much as it would have grown but there were no cuts so I mean, ultimately it was going to be more money than it was last year and it was a promise to maybe cut you know oh an, an undisclosed amount so 
well, it, it goes up 10% and they say, well, it would have been 12%, but instead it only went up 10%. You don't know the difference. Well, that's like, that's the sad thing is, is people don't even, I mean, obviously, I, I rem, it's funny, I remember when he came out with that and I remember, you know, obviously all the liberals and progressives jumped all over him just because of who he was and, and a lot of, a lot of the, the, the conservatives all that defended it and you know there's oh see here's somebody fiscal responsibility all this bullshit but like you said it, it's funny that they don't but they don't even recognize the fact that it's it's you break it down to simple terms it's what he's doing he's a used car salesman yeah he's well, presenting I, he's presenting it at a you know he's presenting it at a highly marked up price so when he drops it down a few bucks you think you're getting a deal and he's still making he's still making a huge profit on it. Mm. Yeah, um, well, I, I think I think even the conservatives were whining about it too because they were afraid that their precious military was going to get cut. Oh yeah, I can't have that. Yeah, it, uh, mm -hmm. military is the largest socialist program in the United States and in the world. It, in the world, it, it <laughs> is. Uh, I, I I mean, the British Department of Health Services is the biggest, but. The uh, the second biggest was probably the United States uh, military, so I it, it boggles my mind how concerned. Like if you was to sit up in the middle of a Tea Party rally or a Republican GOP meeting or a conservative thing or, or most libertarian thing uh, political conventions and say, hey, look, we should probably completely defund this socialist military. It's a socialist program that we don't need anymore. Like they they would probably want to fucking castrate you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, you cut the military and, and the, say, look, the military should be only voluntary. Like if you want to be in the military, you have to volunteer and you get paid nothing. Hmm. Oh, you, hmm. you mean like a, like a militia? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, if, if you cut the schools, then parents that are looking for a daycare program, you know, they're going to freak out. You cut the military, the neocons are going to freak out. If you cut welfare then the lefties are going to freak out if you cut social security and, and medicare you know the seniors are going to freak out so when, when it comes to like this incremental reduction you know getting five percent off of the current budget so you know take this year's well not that there actually is a budget it's just a continuing resolution but if you take this year's amount and next year it's only 95 percent which group do you think would not be freaking out They all well. Maybe the the people that are still farming sheep to make mohair <laughs> uniforms for the Korean War. I don't know. <laughs> that would probably be the one military program that had a, a small reduction. <laughs> yeah, there's a Tom Woods video called Four Things a State Is Not," and it's a really good one. It was a uh, he made a point about you know when they tried to cut the uh, uh, when when the defense bill wouldn't get passed under. Um, I can't remember who. Um, they said, "Oh well, I guess we instead of cutting the hundred million dollar uh, Marine, uh, Army, uh, and Navy uh, marching band program, we're going to pull all of our troops away from uh, Russia." So it was like, and then when they said that, they were like, "Oh, oh shit! Well, well let's fund them then because we can't have our troops away from Russia." <laughs> so it's yeah. always it's always the. You know, it's the Washington Monument thing. Like, they, they, they wanted money for parks and services, and they were like, yeah, we'll get that money. And they just they closed down the Washington Monument and said, you can't come on here. We're, we, we don't have the money for it. Is so, that during that last shutdown? Uh, no, this is a while back. Okay, because you know during that last shutdown, uh, people were just moving the barricades, so they said, fuck your barricades. <laughs> well, we, don't, yeah. we don't need government to walk in the woods. <laughs> Talk about right. the national parks. Yeah, well, it's, yeah, it's they, they they did do it last time, but that's what it, it's called. I, I think it's called the Washington Monument Syndrome. Is the whole idea about that? That you know that that's how they. It's it's like they get their way by stomping their feet and you know like a like a giant child and saying, "Well, I'm taking my ball and going home unless you do what I want." And then people, you know, because <laughs> yeah. well, because somebody because because something some program some government any government program is always frequented by somebody, you know, some people. So they're always going to be affected if it gets threatened to get shut down. And if they have a lobby that's strong enough, they will rally their troops anytime the threat is there. So people just come out in droves and say, no, we need this. We need this, even if it's a small group, because they need it. They need it. And it's uh, I mean, what's that line? You know, there's nothing more permanent than a uh, temporary government program. Yeah. 
because they never go away. Let you me know? let me tell you how committed to limiting government neocons are. Their last their last argument recently for uh, for the drug war is that if we pull back on drug regulations, that DEA agents and the DEA would be gutted, and we would lose that that uh, essential government program. That's yeah. how com- that's how committed to limited government they are. Yeah, well, they love their socialism. Exactly, it's so funny. We can't, that... we, we, can't we can't have the drug agency around if they're if they're not arresting think... drug people. We'll find something else for them to do. It's okay. Yeah. Like, yeah. No, no, no. Think of the poor <laughs> drug enforcement agents, little kid that ain't. They're gonna get kicked out of their house because daddy lost his job. Right in the fields. Think about it. You know, <laughs> you know, we're gonna see fucking Trump out there p- parading around like Obama. You know, I was in Nevada the other day talking with a DEA agent, you know, and he said that he's afraid he's going to lose his job. So if I get in, we're going to tighten down. We're going to buff the DEA up with some more money. You know, it's just so stupid. Well, the, the conservatives, particularly the Second Amendment lickers, they should, uh, they, they should really support having the DEA because without the war on drugs and all the shootings down in Mexico, there wouldn't be anything for the ATF to do. And, and damn it, if, if you get rid of the DEA, then the ATF winds up just standing around with their thumbs in their asses. <laughs> and I, we can't, can't have, have that. that. No, no, and, no. And, and, and not to mention all those prison guards. And I, I tell you what, it, it's worth it to break up families, uh, cause men to get raped, and create trauma, and just absolutely destroy a person psychologically just so that these fucking tax eater parasites can have jobs. <laughs> yeah, that's their argument. You know, that's when you know you've completely lost the war. There, Danilo, <laughs> when yeah. your last when your last argument is, but the the DEA jobs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and 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 that's when you realize that the that the neocons are subscribers to Bernie Sanders' economics lessons. <laughs> I saw a great um, uh, meme by uh, or a quote by Leonard uh, Lawrence Reed. He says every baby is a welfare statist, you know, because you, you cry, 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 <laughs> you know, you, you 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 cry until you get what you want. You don't care where it came from. You don't care how how much it costs. <laughs> you don't care who gives it to you, <laughs> you know. And freedom is about growing up <laughs> and understanding there is cost, right, and that things are not free. <laughs> I yeah. got told by a socialist the other day that economics is a lie that white man made up. Left or right wing <laughs> social, left, left or right wing socialist. It was just a uh, atypical socialist I was having a quite the discussion with, <laughs> of him just being an idiot and me going, "What are you talking about again?" <laughs> Economics, the theory of the marketplace, is just a lie that white men made up. Like that is that is when you know you have nothing nothing to say. Like I have nothing to say. I have nothing to say. But Dave, that's just your opinion, right? You're entitled to your opinion, right? <laughs> you know, I guess fucking. <laughs> Everything else is a lie that white men. Everything else that's based in ration and, and logic is just another lie that a white guy thought up while he was deviously plotting it in his basement. Yeah, well, come on, was, lo- logic it, was pointed out by a white man, wasn't it? So come on. Now. Oh yeah, it was, huh? <laughs> you know, if it, if it wasn't you know, those for those evil warning, white men. Goddamn misogynists. If, if it wasn't if it wasn't for warning lab, labels on electronic devices, that asshole socialist probably never would have made it out of childhood. <laughs> right. Yeah, it it blow it blows my mind, and then you know you have the, the these arbitrary they can't so like how much government is enough and how little government is enough. Like the socialists, they they're like, oh, we need ultimate government. It should do everything. It's ridiculous that anyone should have to even fucking lift a finger these days. The government should just come into our house and wipe our ass and feed us, and then leave and turn on the TV while they're on the, walking out. Uh, you know? <laughs> and, and, and it's like, well. Who's going to pay for that? And then you know it's like the the the, the limited. Oh, we just need police courts and 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 um and military. It's like okay, but how much military and you know and all this and it's just they they don't think these things through. They just they, they like I said with Lawrence, you know these the statist mind. They just want to throw shit out. It's like a it's like they want to throw a pickle up against a glass and and see how long it's going to stay up there and then turn around and run away. You know, like they don't want to. <laughs> They just want to spout out shit and then go, all right, I don't want to rationally defend that or anything. I just wanted to say that and get the hell out of here because <laughs> I have nothing else to say or, because I live on bumper sticker logic. Or, or those, yeah. those people that comment under our videos and say, um, 
volunteerists are in, in, indoctrinated and then they disable the reply button. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> you mean right? comments? You mean comments that I delete? <laughs> right. Uh -oh. Yeah. The the limited government types. It, it, it's like they're playing blackjack. So a new a new new government program comes around. They're they're kind of looking at. It, they're like, okay, hit me. They're looking at their cards. Okay, that's a three. No problem. Hit me again. Ooh, that's a five. I'm getting closer. Hit me. Ace. Ooh, do I go with the one or the 11? Oh, I'll go with the one. And then they're like, hit me. And you get a king, and it's like, boom, you're bust, North Korea. That, 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 <laughs> that's, that's limited government, folks, because they ne never really met too many expansions in government that they didn't like. Now, it's, it's, it's like with Social Security. Back in the old days, they were fighting and, and, and hooting and hollering about social, social security, the Republicans were. And now they're talking about, you know, now their mission is to conserve it, to make sure that it's there for the future. So, you know, the, the Democrats come up with the socialistic programs. You know, the liberals come up with the giveaways. And then the Republicans conserve them. <laughs> Yeah, and, well. and the same and the same thing's going to happen with Obamacare. You you watch in, in twenty thirty years if if there's not a mushroom cloud over the USSA, they're still going to be campaigning on it. Well, if you if you vote for us, or you better vote for us, otherwise Obamacare won't never get repealed. <laughs> well, yeah, because the, well, it's it's because that's you know the the uh, elite just keeps plodding along and they just keep changing the language so that every twenty or thirty years. The next crop of people believe the same. They believe the bullshit that they were supposed to be against because they're could. They all it takes was changing the words and going. Oh no, it's this. Okay, <laughs> it's non cons it's yeah. constitutional. You know, it. I, I've talked to a lot of people from other countries, and this whole this whole thing of the constitution. I mean, there's constitution humpers everywhere. Yeah, it, it's it's frightening. Yeah. I mean, they're wow. just they're just licking that constitution. It, you know what? Government is like a rapist, and the constitution is the roofie. <laughs> <laughs> that is that's a good uh, nice. um, good analogy my, there. My my mother in law uh, grew up in communist Romania, and uh, and I you know I talked to her about how it was, and she doesn't really tell me that it was horrible, and I didn't really understand why for many years until recently I realized. Wait a minute, she had a government job. <laughs> yeah. She was working in the railroad. <laughs> That's why I'm like, who's paying for this? Who's the you know who's the, uh, oh, the was... private industries that they're ripping off to to you know to fund all these boondoggles? It was, it was, <laughs> it, it was wonderful. We had a place to live. I had a job. Exactly. It was it's like everybody. It's like we didn't want we anything um, you know material possessions. Everybody had the same food. You know, you would knock on your neighbor's door for sugar. Everybody was happy because we all had very little until you know. The TV, you know, showed the West and, you know, all this materialism. And then, and then she comes over here and, of course, you know, you know, she, she, she loves the, you know, credit cards and uh, <laughs> you know, free money. And she's in a massive amount of debt because she has no idea what, you know, what it means to uh, be accountable. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I'm sure she was a nice lady. I'm sure, I'm sure that she was so nice that if one of her neighbors wound up taking a train ride to the camp, she'd make sure they got a window seat. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, was, I, was, right. I was reading that guy or listening to that guy that's like uh, t talking about how it really was in the, in, the, in the Soviet Union at the height of the, you know, the ridiculousness. And uh, uh, he, he was saying, you know, you could go through a neighborhood and find out who worked for the government because they'd have a, a car in the driveway because it was illegal for no, if you weren't in the prolet bureau or like officially mandated to have a car, you couldn't have one. It was illegal. <laughs> so like you could tell who worked for the government by just walking or riding a bike through a neighborhood and seeing all the cars in the driveways. Was it was that a uh, Yuri Maltsev? It might have. It might have been. Yeah, I, real I, he real heavy guy, real funny. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> I can't remember. It. I was Russian I was, I, guy. Has yeah. an accent. Yeah, yeah. Well, all Russian guys have an accent, so. <laughs> I've, I've, was that an absolute? Was that another absolute, Dave? Um, I uh, find me a Russian I, that doesn't I, I, have an accent. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Dave. Um, I have. Uh, I've heard a couple of people tell tell stories like that, though. But uh, but but yeah. Again, when you're on the inside of that, you don't see it because to you it seems wonderful, and and they don't have to think beyond. Well, if everything's fine for us because we have the government job. And all these other people are getting poorer and poorer. Well, right. 
right. what happens when nobody else is paying in. Like they don't think about right. that. It's the whole, you know, everybody everybody wants to jump on the wagon until they re and it takes them forever to realize that nobody's pushing anymore, mm -hmm. and uh, until the things start falling apart. <laughs> Um, you know, and that's like I said, because I, again, every they think they think backwards on everything. They, you know, they get propagandized, so they see, they hear the sanitized versions of the past um, in order to to mask the mistakes uh, that they don't want them to see. You know, anywhere it doesn't matter, not not just here in in all you know the the history of everywhere that's uh, fudged, <laughs> to put it yeah. nicely. Um, well, he, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but That's okay. I, when when you go back to like the the legend of the fondling fathers and this mythology <laughs> about them, you know, people will say, "Oh, but they they were, you know, they were farmers." If by farmers you mean plantation owners, yeah, because <laughs> because who, you know, it, 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 you know, I'm talking about like the attendees at the uh, at the or the the coup of 1787. Yeah. If you if you Google attendees at the 1787 Constitutional Convention, you're gonna get a list of people that most of them you probably haven't never heard of. Mm -hmm. And you know they say, oh, it was farmers, plantation owners, it was merchants. No, it was mercantilists. <laughs> <laughs> I, it was I, attorneys. It, it was yeah. lawyers. Yeah, I, it was it was literally lawyers, guns, and money at the, at the convention. Those were the attendees. Yeah. It was so, just the, it was just the, it was just the, uh, a mafia set down. That's all it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was like Appalachian, <laughs> but but nobody got arrested, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, it's uh, you know, I, it, it was a, a good portion of the folks here were banksters and lawyers, mm -hmm. but people have this this hagiography, this religiosity of oh, it was these selfless Christ-like figures. No, it was a bunch of politicians. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Wait, yeah. I was just going to say, yeah, there's, I mean, there's people, there's people that still venerate, uh, that, 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 that worship, uh, Hamilton, you know, of all, you know, of all, yeah, or, well, I mean, that's just, I'm just, I'm just talking about like at the beginning with those people, you know, like they don't, they don't even see that. There's still people that, Oh yeah, these guys were great guys. It's like, no, e like that's even like, I guess mainstream information I to, you know I hate to use that term but that you know that what he wanted um and it's still like no these these were great men cuz they did so, cuz they did something you know they got rid of one king okay what did they do after that they they don't want to think they don't want to think past it cuz it's like it's this axiomatic thing to them well no the constitution is good the constitution is Holy, <laughs> yeah. for lack of a better yeah. term. What did those founding lawyers do? Well, they raised an army to fight a war partially over a 3% beverage tax, and then they raised a standing army to put down a rebellion over a 25% beverage tax. So, yes. yeah, they're, they're great guys, yeah. So, I... So, no. um, so Trump, I'm, I'm reading an article, <laughs> Trump just came out and said... The Department of Education is, oh, is must go. It's the first thing he's going to do when he's in office. He's going to completely gut the Department of Education. So this is what is this a play to rile up the mini statist? Uh, yeah, uh, I would is. I would remind you that uh, who was it? Uh, Ronald Reagan was going to uh, was going to get rid of the Department of Education. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, uh, oh yeah, that's right. He strengthened it. And, and I, <laughs> I, I, I get, I really get a kick out of these adults that understand that pro wrestling is fake, but they still believe that politics is real. And, and, and even <laughs> after all these years of getting the tip in the shaft, they're, they're still believing the campaign promises of politicians. You know, it, it, it's like the dumb girl that, that keeps getting banged by every guy on the football team and doesn't understand why. <laughs> it, it, yeah. uh, uh, if, if campaign promises equal doing the opposite once they're in offices, I almost want Bernie Sanders to win then if that's the logic. <laughs> because yeah. if you look at Eric, like Obama, I'm going to close Gitmo. I'm going to get us out of the wars. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. He's done literally to the T the opposite of everything he ran on. Literally. And uh, George Bush, I'm going to cut taxes. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make sure that you know we we strengthen our military and all this. Yeah. <laughs> well, of course, but that's that, that's why the wrestling analogy is a really good one. Except I would posit that wrestling is actually more real because at least those guys get hurt every once in a while. Well, wrestling is real. 
Uh oh, <laughs> people, people are fake. Oh, we forgot, we forgot, we forgot, we forgot. I forgot about, we forgot about Dave's uh, affinity people, for uh, no, wrestling. no, wrestling is real. People are fake. That's okay. yeah. In 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 uh, wrestling, they touch each other's ass in the ring. In politics, they wait till they go back, go backstage. <laughs> Hey, look, I'm a, I'm a lifetime wrestling fan, so I, don't, I, got, I got nothing to say here. I love wrestling, and I am you know, Jack's. I am Jack's complete lack of surprise. <laughs> you know, uh, it's like this. You know, people like comic books. They like movies. Lou, you like bacon. You know, same way. I like wrestling. You're comparing bacon to pro wrestling. Yeah, it's, it's oh. that good. It's that good. Like no one sits there and yells at someone. For watching uh, Grey's Anatomy, you're like, you're watching this stupid show. It's fake as hell. What are you doing? It's fake. It doesn't yeah. exist in reality. You know, and then it's like you watch wrestling and then it's the same damn thing. <laughs> I want to go back to uh, better, acting, uh, better acting in Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> you hush your mouth, John Cena. <laughs> Uh, you know, Jeremy, you're talking about um, you know the difference between a government job and a and a private job, and I think I think one of the confusions is people um, mix the two together as if a government job is the same thing as a private job, right? I'm just getting paid. You know, what's the difference? Job, I do, well, job, I do something and I get paid, right? But you know, they don't really you don't realize uh, the theft and the coercion behind it, and that you know a, a um, you know a government job exists only through theft and coercion, no demand whatsoever, whereas a private job had to be. Um, desired by the customer or somehow created and marketed and you know people came to want it want more of it so it's it's entirely voluntary it's completely different and every government job basically destroys you know proportionally or even even more because you're robbing the people in the process it, every private job right so so the larger the larger the government that you know the government gets and and the bureaucracy and all the all the middlemen and all and all that you know the you know proportionally the uh the private sector, the one that's actually paying for it and supporting it and funding it, <laughs> dwindling away, and nobody seems to care. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm kind of gonna go off on a side tangent here, uh, and and this is something I've been thinking about for probably the past couple of weeks. Uh, yeah, we can point out that go, that you know all government jobs are theft and, and stuff like that, and really, what impact is that going to have on the average statist? Little to none. Yeah, little to none. So I, I, I kind of see it as wasting, wasting your breath. You know, it's, it's kind of like trying to explain to Dave that you know, politics <laughs> and wrestling are the same thing, except <laughs> wrestling has a better physical fitness and politics has less I, I spandex. I voluntarily, <laughs> give my, I voluntarily give my patronage to uh, any wrestling company. I, I don't have that same relationship with government. Yeah. So, so I mean, you, you can bring this stuff up, but if you don't if have If you want to do this, we can do it. <laughs> if, you, if you don't have a potentially receptive audience, then it's really not going to – it's really not going to do anything. And you may, as well be, you may as well be shouting at your windshield in a traffic jam. Well, it's like the same thing as like uh, if you want to walk up to a Wait hardcore – Wait that doesn't work. <laughs> you walk up to a hardcore Muslim or a hardcore Christian or whatever and say, hey, God doesn't exist – you're going to get the same thing as, you know, taxes or theft to a status. Like, yeah, th that's that's the exact same thing. It's a uh, belief in a state is an indoctrinated belief, just like the majority of re religion. There yeah. are some people that go, you know what? I, I, you know, this is the way I want to go with my life. But like no one does that with a state. Right. Yeah. And if you go tell uh, if you go tell a Christian or a Muslim, there is no God. They'll say, well, I'll pray for you. And you'd be like, well, have fun talking to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, they're they're not going to be very receptive. I th I think if anything is going to put people off, and, and and quite frankly, I I can't blame the the postal carrier, you know, for going out and doing that thing, you know, doing their thing. Yeah, they're they're tax eaters. They're they're a much lesser degree of tax eater than some things, you know, because I mean mm -hmm. people actually do pay to send junk mail to me. <laughs> but uh, you know. Same with the same with the janitor at the DEA, you know. Mm. I, mean, I I think it's a much lesser degree of of uh, bad guy, much 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 lesser. Okay, so the mail carrier for the Nazis was he a bad guy or was he just a much lesser degree? Because he was essentially tran he was yeah. carrying orders from commander to soldier, right? Well, was he just the mail carrier for just Nazis or was he actually the German people? Because otherwise. German German um, nationalist. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, the, otherwise, your, your okay. comparison isn't complete, Dave. 
Okay. All right. Let, mm -hmm. let me correct you because he was not an employee of the Bundespost. He was a, a, a employee of the Wehrmacht, and he was a courier, not a carrier. There you go. <laughs> so, my impl my my implication still is the point. No, because if it's if it's if it's a postal worker, it's the same thing. If it's a government agency, yes, it's, it's still lesser because he's not. It still he's perpetuates not... the state. Okay, but we've had this discussion before, Dave. Oh, everything we, we do, technically, if if you use that standard, then everything perpetuates the state. Making Thanks. use of the things that you're that you're forced to use, because again, you're. <clears throat> You're no, not I actually mean, forced unless in there a lot was of situations. Unless there was conscription involved with a socialist postal office, I, I don't see how that stands up. No, like, no one forces someone to go work for the post office. No one I goes, hey, I didn't say you were hey, guess what? It's your time to serve the state, so you got to go work for the postal office. I didn't say you were forced to work for the post office. We're saying that you, it's a lesser degree because they're not, they're, they're not doing anything else other than taking the money to you. In any way, because you, like I said, you can't use the perpetuating the state argument because everything everybody does perpetuates the state in some way, unless you're leading completely 100% agoristic life and not having any contact whatsoever with any part of government. So that's well, using, not, not using roads, not using Federal Reserve. Exactly. Roads. That's just, yeah. yeah, uh, yeah <laughs> driving, driving on the grass, buying yeah. black market <laughs> gasoline. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, back to what we were saying. We're gonna kind of wrap up our um, bull crap incremental how it's not well, going to fix anything well what i want to do is I, I i still want to touch on a few more things there the first thing that i want to touch on is uh if government is a good thing if if it's necessary why on earth would you ever limit it mm. yeah <laughs> yeah and, and and really the the mini status and there's a meme going out <laughs> about this it's uh it, it talks about the total total socialism having control over everything, and and I personally believe that the that the total socialist, the total statist, is more intellectually consistent in their beliefs than the many statist, because the many statist is of the mind that government should only cover the police, military, and courts. Well, once you have the police, military, and courts, it's just a matter of time before you cover everything else. Yeah. And. Yeah, it shouldn't cover, you know, government shouldn't be doing anything except the very, the most important things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the corrupt and competent government that can't run a post office, set up a healthcare website or anything else should be, should be handling the thing that nobody else can do. You know, if, if you want to be logically consistent, uh, the, the national defense status should love Obamacare because their justification for government control of the national defense is that they're the, that's the most complicated most important thing on earth well if it's the most complicated important thing on earth and only government can handle it then it should have no problem handling something even simpler like i don't know health care for 300 plus million people a <laughs> postal service you know all those other things and and when you talk about that the, you know they have this disconnect they have this cognitive dissonance that comes in here but anyway uh, going back to the idea of uh, incremental reduction of the state the first question is, how does this happen? Now, we know that people aren't going to vote against their interests. Seniors aren't going to vote to, to end Social Security and Medicare or, or slash the cost of it to you know, cut the deficit and everything else. And we know that the welfare people aren't going to, cut, aren't going to vote to cut off welfare. The military-industrial complex doesn't want an end to the war. You know, and, and, and quite frankly, let, let's say that you got a bunch of Ron Pauls in there. You know, like let's say you cloned him and Ron Paul was running around with 535 mini me's. <laughs> <laughs> what, what if if the elections are legitimate? <laughs> There's okay. a short animated movie somebody has yeah. to make. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So first thing is how how do all these Ron Pauls get voted in office? Because you know we the people have varying political ideologies. I mean, you have the the total status that thinks the government should be in charge of everything so how is how are these ron pauls getting elected they're not okay but let, let's say they get like teleported into into mordor on the potomac and somehow they wind up in office you know who knows how it happens uh, call it magic uh, that seems to be a, a viable theory if you look at bernie bernie sanders economic policies <laughs> or or most of trump's policies too so 
let, let's say all these people get in there and let's say that elections are legitimate they're not rigged in any way shape or form uh and all these people support all this government welfare so what happens you know two years down the road when there's a midterm election or or you know every six years when there's a senatorial election or every four years when there's a presidential election you know don't these people get voted out of office for shrinking this necessary, legitimate, and sometimes good government? Absolutely. It's well because it, it's it, it that it's funny. As, you know, we always get called the utopians because you know we just want to be free and let everybody figure out things on their own. Um, but there, the, the, these people are constantly. You know, it's the one step forward, five steps back because it's like, well, no, yeah, we can get them in, and like you said, they'll just they'll get kicked out. But no. They'll, they'll somehow, some way, they'll manage to stay in office long enough to fix everything. But Pe they... people will learn to love smaller government. They'll learn to love fewer handouts. Well, yeah, of course, <laughs> but that, like I said, that, that's why I said earlier. I, I think that's. I think it's. I think while I, I, because somebody actually said something to me before before we recorded the show earlier. They were. Uh, I think they were a little upset about the title we were going with, um, uh, and thinking it's. Uh, Incrementalism, LOL. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think that's a great title. I, yeah, I do too. Um, well, no, no, we just need a limited government dictator, okay? Well, no. the, the, that way voting just goes away and we just have one guy at the top who just says, look, I'm going to do what's best for everybody. And you know what? It's my way or the highway. You know, that's, that's essentially what uh, conservatarians and many statists want. Well, yeah, no. Pretty well, they, much. Even, even, even if they believe their claims that they want this... I want to force my beliefs on other people. That, yeah. Well, yeah, they don't want to see that aspect of it. it like I said, they, they, they're the, for that reason. I'm more afraid of them because they're the ones. If they get positive results, it just reinforces their belief. It doesn't. I don't think it helps our cause. That's what I was starting to say before. That with incrementalism, I, I can see the benefits to some. You know, like somebody like Adam Kokesh who talks about running in 2020 on a platform of you know, the peaceful dissolution of the, the you know, incrementally <laughs> of the federal government down to states, down to local, and yada, yada, yada. Um, and while it sounds nice, like I said, the people that are, which it's, it's so weird because these are the people that are normally closer to our end of the spectrum. Um, but at the same time, they're also, I mean, I guess because the, they're in their death throes because they're fighting so viciously to ignore these contradictions and the, this hypocrisy that they just blatantly spew. Um, I, I can't yeah, wait for my Kokesh 2020 bumper sticker. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. Do you have a free Adam t-shirt? Because those never go out of style. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> He's always in jail. <laughs> yeah, so... I, if I were going Lou, to just... would you run for limited government dictator, or would you become a limited government dictator for every? The, not not necessarily the dictator that Americans uh, deserve, but the ones that they need. <laughs> <laughs> what if, is... if, if 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 Buddha or whoever is up there came down and gave you the ring of power, would you do it? What is no? <laughs> All right, I was just testing. It was a little test. Yeah, I w w when I hear this, you know, we're gonna take power. We're gonna incrementally get rid of it. I, I I just think that the slogan is "stealing underpants creates smaller government." <laughs> Here, here's I don't get it, but here here's the thing. Well, the only case of incrementalism that I can rebut with anything you've said is slavery. And that hardcore chattel slavery was democratically overturned in the Brit British Empire. All right. So, how was that a net negative? It's probably not a net negative. Uh, but what you have to understand is that a significant number of people wanted to end slavery. Now, here, when it comes to the state, you have a large number of people that support slavery, and they are the slaves. I, yeah, exactly. I, now, no, so democracy else, is slavery. Like yeah. no one's debating that. I'm just saying, like yeah. hardcore chattels, people mm -hmm. can own people. Yeah. Not the state owns the people, but people can own people. That was overturned democratically. Yeah. 
Well, uh, the sun well, shines on a dog's ass every once in a while too. Does that make it, you know, like? like no, no, no. Like, like the, the just like, they get is... something right. Just as they, just because they get something right, does not justify the immorality of everything else they do. Now, would you like? I, to, I, 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 would you like I, to I, talk I, about my broken clock? No, 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 no. no. I, I get, I get the rebuts, and I, and I understand that. But like, what, 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 how does? How is that? How do you defeat that response right there? Because I, whenever I make a statement you or anything, I, I always say, "Okay, how would I answer this?" Because I think the problem is, is people think that as long as the right people have authority, things are going to be okay, and it's they never realize that authority is the problem. That is true. Mm-hmm. So, I, like, I would agree with you. Like, slavery um, wouldn't have existed without a state, you know, without the state. Period. So, like, all, almost every case of slavery is state-sanctioned state or by some governing body, whether it be a tribe's elderman or, or whether it be an emperor. You know, they're all state-sanctioned. There's very few cases of slavery without a state or a government body. So they're just fixing this, this problem that the state creates. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, it, it's kind of like the argument that without a big, strong government, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 never would have been passed, and all of the segregation and Jim Crow laws that were in place by the small, weak, powerless government would still mm-hmm. be in place. No, I, I agree. I just, I, I, I'm trying to break down arguments before people have them, for them, because whenever I have an argument or whenever I, t- whenever I say something, I always think, what could be said to defeat this? It's the natural debater in me. And the okay. only thing that I can mentally come up with is the incrementalism that happened in Britain paved the way for a whole new world where chattel slavery is basically, I mean, if, if it was at 50% when it got banned by Britain, it's at 10 or lower now. I mean, there's still chattel slaves out there, but mm-hmm. like the effect of... I, w- I, w- I wouldn't say that, um, you know... <laughs> like it was because we had the right people in power that it ended slavery. I think the general consciousness of the people kind of came to realize, perhaps because of the abolitionists influencing them, that they under began to understand that that chain slavery is immoral, and then and then government had to react accordingly. So in the same way, so so government for, for like people, you know, people uh, love uh, you know the child labor laws, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> abolitionist in the house. Exactly. <laughs> so, so people attribute, you know, without the government, we would still have, uh, you know, without child labor laws, we would still have, you know, toddlers working in, you know, in uh, sixteen-hour days, you know, <laughs> you know, even today, right? But, but they, it's they, really, they'd be, they'd be at the auto plants because, I mean, why in the hell would you hire like a fully mature adult male to put <laughs> engines and transmissions in a vehicle when you could grab a toddler to do it? <laughs> right. Absolutely. Right. Right, so so it's it's not these laws that have changed reality. It's reality and technology that has changed re- that has, that has changed the world, and then government just responds as a result, right? Like like the minimum wage, you know, d- doesn't it it, it it adjusts only after people's wages have like increased so much, and then they're like, all right, now the floor is here, and then they increase even more. No, now the floor is here. <laughs> well, but regardless, so people are getting richer regardless. Well, let's let's talk about the child labor laws for a minute and let's look at a couple of different situations here in the ussa the first real strong child labor laws came around in the in the thirties it may have been like thirty four thirty five something like that at the time about six percent of children under the age of sixteen were working and not in school was that the um... fair wages and labor act I, I don't I don't remember specifically what it was called, but at the time, only about six percent of children under the age of sixteen were working. Mm-hmm. How many of those were strippers? I'm just asking for Danilo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Lou's I'm like, not, how I'm do not, I? S- <laughs> I'm not really sure. Now, of that six <laughs> of that six percent that were working. Four out of five of those were working in agriculture, mm-hmm. meaning on farms. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That child labor law excluded agriculture. If, if you go into your place of employment and they have the human resources posters up to talk about child labor laws and everything, go have a look at it. You will see that it excludes child or that child labor is permitted in agriculture to this day. 
Mm. Also, also, when they came up with those child labor laws, working for government was excluded. Mm. And also, working in the entertainment field was excluded because at the time, the, the I think the highest paid entertainer was, uh, oh, God, Shirley, uh, Shirley Temple. Shirley Temple, yeah. Yeah, mm. that was a lot of tax towers coming out of her. <laughs> oh, yeah, couldn't, 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 shut, couldn't shut that cash guy down. <laughs> yeah. But who doesn't love Shirley Temple? Yeah, but, but here's here's the thing, though. What government did was it chased a trend and took credit for it. Mm -hmm. They jumped out in front of the parade and pretended to lead it. Oh, well, that was uh, right. that was um, what Donnie was asking me the other day. Donnie Gabbert, uh, he was asking me, uh, is a government a lagging indicator? <laughs> is, is it is it always no it, was it, it was always always a, is lagging. It always a lagging indicator like he, we were actually trying to come up with a uh a situation where they were actually a lead a leading indicator versus a lagging one and the only thing i i could come up with was war <laughs> you, you know when it comes to government regulation it's an excellent history lesson because the current regulations are based upon actual historical things I, let's take this for example back in the 70s and i can't remember the guy's name um but he lived out in California, and the smog in Los Angeles was just absolutely horrible. So he says, holy crap, i got to do something about this. So he winds up coming up with the catalytic converter. Mm -hmm. So let, let, let's say he had never gone into his workshop and started working on the catalytic converter, or three years before uh, he had started working on it, government came out with a regulation that says, okay, we have to get these emissions reduced by this amount. Uh, go out, and somebody must go out and invent this thing called a catalytic converter. <laughs> wouldn't have happened right right so so the only way that I, 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 let's let's say that back in the 30s kids were working all all over the place what you have to look at is why they are working and if some politicians scribble mm -hmm. some stuff down on paper how's that going to change it right exactly <laughs> now, yeah yeah now let, let's fast forward into the 90s and i believe it was bangladesh uh there was a group called Oxfam. I think you guys are probably familiar with them, part of them at least. Yeah, I've heard, I, I, I think I've heard the name, yeah. Okay. Their fields were, were very butthurt over the child labor in Bangladesh. Oh, okay. So, yes, 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 yeah. Okay. So they, you know, did all this lobbying and, and demanded child labor laws and everything else. So mm -hmm. kids are no longer allowed to work in the factory. Well, what you have to look at is why those kids are working in the factory to begin with. And it's not because mm -hmm. their parents hate them. It's not because they're mean. It's not because they're sitting home watching soap operas and eating bonbons all day. It's because they're so damn poor that they need the income from these children just to make freaking ends meet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so. That's the convenient so, fact that that's the convenient fact that always gets left out of the equation. Yeah, you're just the evil capitalist overlord apologist. Okay. Yes, uh, I am. Now shut your pie hole. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but 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 here's here's the thing, and and bless their hearts for it. You know, when well, I'm saying bless their hearts, I'm not saying it in the southern way. You know what I'm talking <laughs> about, Dave. <laughs> yeah, you know, bless their hearts for this. After they had lobbied for these new labor laws preventing child labor, they actually realized that they screwed up and they admitted to it because now that this in additional income from the children isn't coming in to you know help feed the children, what do you think happened to them? They're dying. <laughs> Prostitution, all kinds of other hellish They're dying. nightmare. They're being sold into slavery. They're being sold into child prostitution because these people are so damn poor and they're so damn desperate that what we consider to be an absolute atrocity is a viable option for them. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, you, uh, you know, another thing that people don't understand is, is like Western values can't be pushed upon the third world or whatever that aren't ready for that. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think that there's a, a society or a people out there that hates their children and, and that they're intentionally mean to their children. Now, it's, that is their situation. I, they're just really that dirt poor that something mm -hmm. that we find unbelievable is a viable option to them. I mean, how many Americans do you think would dumpster dive for food? I mean, uh, you do. You'd have to be pretty damn hungry. You'd have to probably go a week or so and probably yeah. exhaust all other options. But there's people in these third world nations that wish that they had dumpsters to dive into. Yeah, well, perspective's a funny thing. <laughs> yeah. 
So when you look at that, you know, okay, so they, they passed a law, and because the the reality wasn't able to support that law, you know, you wind up having something a hell of a lot worse than what it would have been. Well, authoritarians don't rely on re- reality. They rely on feels and propaganda. Yeah, pretty much. Which, yeah, pro- but... which propaganda is just feels and a different, you know, delivered deliberately. Yeah. So when we look at when we look at the sort of thing, the child labor laws, okay, can government create an outcome just by making declarations and scribbling words on paper? They can't. You know, th- there has to be something in place. And here in America, it was actually the market. It was the productivity because, you know, I'm sure you guys have all seen the movie The Outlaw Josie Wales, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, opening scene, Josie's out there plowing the field with his, with uh, little Josie. He's probably about a 10-year-old kid, something like that. So instead of having like a fancy tractor or, or even hand tools that he got down at Home Depot or something like that, he's got this rickety plow being pulled by a mule, mm-hmm. and his little boy is going in front of him picking up rocks that he's, you know, that he's actually big enough to pick up and moving them out of the field so that the field can get plowed. Mm-hmm. So I mean, you take a look at that kid, you're like, wow, well, that's, you know, if he gets a really big rock, he's pretty much useless. You know, something that you need an adult for. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's the advancements in technology that have been able to take kids out of the fields, out of the factories, because they're now able to be more productive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, well. and, 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 and something else, now that, now that you don't have Clint Eastwood you know, holding up a plow that a mule is pulling, the number of back injuries because of tractors in the agricultural field has, you know, literally disappeared. I mean, if, <laughs> if you get a back injury, it's because you were jumping in and out of the damn tractor like an idiot instead of, you know, <laughs> instead of using three points of contact. <laughs> yeah. and, and the, Always do three points of contact, yeah. Danilo and Jeremy. Always. <laughs> but, but there Learn are, that one the hard way. Now, for the four of us, we, we sit down and have this conversation, and it, it, it's, it makes absolute 100% complete sense. And we can look at this, and we can, we can see this, and, and we can actually visualize it in our heads of, okay, well, this is why this works this way. Mm-hmm. Now, you talk to the average economic illiterate status, you know, the Bernie supporter, hell, most of the Republicans, and they have no idea. You know, they have no understanding of this. If if you lay that, if you lay down on them what I just laid down on you guys, their eyes glaze over, they freak out. And hell, they can't figure out whether it was the Great De- or whether it was the, the New Deal or World War II that ended the Great Depression. It was neither. And if you make an <laughs> argument for one, you're making an argument for the other because in both cases, the government took over the economy, spent a bunch of money, ran up a bunch of debt, destroyed private sector jobs, and the idea that one of them ended the Great Depression and the other did not, and that's that's absolutely asinine. <laughs> but unemployment was low while the war was going on, Lou. Well, Come of, on. Course, of course it was, because how many men were sent overseas? 11 million, okay? Okay, <laughs> all right, you take 11 million out of the workforce, all right. Well, you know, you know what? Uh, I knew if you kill 1.1, kill or cripple 1.1 million people to get the unemployment rate down, uh, <laughs> I, I, think th- I think there's better ways to do that. All right. Just saying. Uh, well, is it, is, will, will it happen as fast? Will it be just as effective? <laughs> In North Korea, they try to push this like 100% employment thing. And so like they have like uh, intersections that have traffic lights built up, but they were like, you know, no, let's turn those off and put somebody out in the street to do traffic because, you know, we need a job. So like, it's like the, the opposite. I'm not saying that traffic lights are like a capitalistic, uh, you know, invention that saves lives. Like they're actually worse and you know, you're better off just having no one in there. But it's just so funny how like, they're like, Hey, yeah, let's, this is a jobs program. So like, you know, if, if Sanders wants jobs, I mean, all he'd have to do is every small town and every city just uh, ban traffic lights and, and put up uh, crossing guards or whatever the hell, traffic directors. You know about the Chinese Canal Project, right? No, I don't. Please okay. inform me. All right. An American economist goes to China, and he's observing this canal project that's going on, and he's out there with the Chinese delegation. Uh, canal? Yeah, canal. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah. So anyway, he's looking around, and all of a sudden it dawns on him that – all these workers are using hand tools. There's no, 
uh, steam shovels, backhoes, bulldozers, nothing like that. It's all it's all regular shovels, picks, axes, hoes, and stuff like that. So he goes over to the uh, head of the Chinese delegation and he says, "You know, I was, I was just noticing that your that your guys are using hand tools from like Walmart instead of uh, instead of industrial equipment." And the leader of the Chinese delegation goes and confers with his colleagues and comes back over and. And he says, well, we have them using hand tools because if they use modern equipment, they'll finish the project sooner and their jobs <laughs> will be gone. Right. The American economist says, oh, it's a jobs program. Why don't you take away their shovels and give them spoons? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, very true. That's uh, that's basically the uh, the Luddite fallacy. You know, people blame blame technology for everything. You know, you know, technology's taking away stealing my jobs, but uh, but really, you know, it's increasing standard of living, increasing wealth, right, and and freeing up people for you know taking higher quality jobs than they otherwise would have. I think there are some things that I do want to cover on here. You know, how does government grow? Generally, it's one law at a time. Sometimes it grows, you know, a couple laws at a time. It depends on how much is in the bill. Mm -hmm. So when you have a limited government with a legislative branch and, it, and their job is to legislate, you can't be surprised when you get a buttload of legislation. And quite frankly, if the Congress went 10, 15 years without popping out any new laws, I think the average person, even the limited government, many states would be saying, damn it, what are we paying you guys for? Make some laws. Now, why does government grow? And I came up with three main reasons this afternoon. One is crisis, either real or imagined. And if you guys have read Robert Haig's Crisis and Leviathan, I haven't read the whole thing, but I've read some excerpts of it. There's always some crisis to justify more government intervention. And as, as he explains it in there in his book, usually it's war. So there's some boogeyman out there that, that requires a big, giant, massive military, which, of course, requires a lot of money to fund that military. And as the military marches abroad, the Treasury is looted at home. Mm -hmm. uh, next up is, you know, just naturally doing the, doing the daily business, you know, interfering with commerce, creating new laws. And then number three that I came up with was parasitism. And that is an opportunity comes up for government to do something for everybody. You know, like let's say schools or universal health care, things like that. And this goes back to the old Bastiat thing of everybody wants to live at the expense of the state, but the state lives at the expense of everybody else. Mm -hmm. So why can't we have incrementalism? Because as Thomas Jefferson said, I'm going to paraphrase, it is the nature of government to grow and for liberty to disappear. Or to be more direct and blunt in it, is the nature of government to grow and consume more resources until absolutely nothing else remains. Mm -hmm. One giant broken window fallacy. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, a so, tick's job is to suck as much blood as it possibly can. And that's, yeah. a government creates freedom like a tick creates blood. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when we talked about the different things earlier about how incremental reduction is an impossibility, all right, so... Yeah, literally, it's stealing underpants creates smaller government. Yeah, and, it, it, <laughs> and it, if you haven't, David, if you haven't seen that South Park episode of the Underpants Gnomes, you got to see it. It's awesome. I think I have. I think I've, hmm. I've seen every episode of South Park. I don't. It's been watching it since I. I mean, how, how long have they been going? Nineteen years. So, I mean, it came out when I was like twelve or eleven. I don't know. <laughs> so, um, so let's get to some. Are you are you done with all that? Yeah, you, you think I pretty much hit it, nailed it. I I can't it. I can't see how at the end of this podcast someone is still for an incremental reduction in the state, without seeing that there's valid, observable contradictions in that that line of thought. Oh, one more thing that I do want to throw in. Okay, so let's say that you're going to attack these little issues incrementally. Do uh, you ever play whack a mole at Chuck E. Cheese? Because <laughs> as, as, as you're, I do as something you're, else at Chuck E. Cheese. Sorry. Okay, so anyway, as, as you're whacking the mole on uh, medical cannabis, there's another mole popping up over here and something else popping up over there. And if, if you look at these places that have a lot of uh, political activism, 
what you have to look at is, okay, so you had some gains here, and you may have had some gains there, but what happened in the rest of the area? At the end of the year, can you look at the size of government and say that you have less government than when you started? Uh, and the, and the, res the response will always be, well, we got the right to carry a one-inch box cutter without a permit. <laughs> <laughs> but but meanwhile, there's there's a... 25 new things that you can be thrown in jail for. Well, your, your point is made perfectly by the recreational laws in, in Colorado. They've ra the government has taken so much money from taxes, they're, they're like, we don't want to give it back. So now they've, the, the people of Colorado are voting on how we can spend the tax money instead of giving everybody, everybody a rebate check to buy mm. more weed. So, yeah. so does that shrink government when they get more money? And also that more money that they're getting is going into cops and the government ind indoctrination gulag. Does it does it sound like there's going to be less government presence there? No. And no. what happens? And what happens if you violate the the regulations on using your cannabis properly? You go to jail. Yeah, you go to jail. So, or as my that, status friend calls it, an adult timeout. Yeah. Spiritual retreat center. So in, instead of enforcing prohibition, they're enforcing regulation. Yeah. The, the SWAT teams now have carry clipboards with them. Yeah, they just they just read or, they they read or, they don't yeah because exactly like Dave said they don't want to give it back they they'll just find yeah. a way to redir redirect the resources, and and no like you said does it like does it ever shrink? No, people get their one little they get their one little pet project taken care of. They get all happy and they don't pay attention to the fact that whether it's on a federal, state, or local level, the regul just the not even the laws, just the ridiculous regulations that get churned out by every a agency or bureaucracy or whatever it is, you know, just constantly that nobody pays attention to, mm -hmm. um, just mount all the time. And when, even if there's a a big push for some big, you know, so-called big issue. Um, the majority of people will easily get sucked up in that and not pay attention to all the other stuff that's happening behind that. Um, or, you know, or like you said earlier, Lou, about what else is attached to the bill too. Like people think, oh yeah, I'm, we're getting this thing. Cause you know, they get easily, most, most status are e easily baffled by the uh, Orwellian language of pretty much every quote unquote major piece of legislation that comes out. It's um, called the USA Patriot Act. That means they're going to give me a, a free flag. Exactly. <laughs> and a, you know, a case of buckshot. Yeah, um, in your ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's, let's hop to some questions. I, I said that you were going to be on the show tonight and um, uh, had a few questions. Uh, Mike asked, uh, by the topic, I would assume he is for education rather than violent revolution. If so, ask his thoughts on why violent revolution won't work. Also, what is his what his experience has been with educating those he's came across on his journey. Well, I am a firm believer in education or evolution and not revolution because what you see today is a result of a revolution back in 1776. And what wound up happening was you had the revolution and the evil king was thrown off and was replaced by new evil kings. Mm -hmm. Or as uh, Mel Gibson explained, trading one tyrant 3,000 miles away for 3,000 tyrants one mile away. Now, mm -hmm. the, the whole thing of violent revolution will never bring liberty. It, it comes down to a few different things. One, who is it that wins the violent revolution? Well, obviously, it is the best at using violence, deception, espionage, and deceit and treasury, treachery. So when, when, that, when that group wins they're not going to say okay you're all free they're going to say oh no we're going to jump in we're going to make sure that that group doesn't come back and then the first thing that they do is start taking measures to ensure that nobody does to them what they just did to the last group you know kind of like the the founding lawyers did with you know coming up with i thought it was the putting, fondling fathers <laughs> it's kind of like you it could go either way but, um, <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I love you, so, Lou. <laughs> oh, I, I, I love you guys too. But anyway, uh, <sighs> but, but uh, <laughs> I, so, I, yeah, they came up the treason laws. They made it illegal to have rebellions. And when there were rebellions, they they gathered the troops and they never said, "Hey, they're rebelling because we're acting like jerks. We're we're acting like like what you know what we replaced." Yeah. 
yeah. and, and which they did, but you know nobody ever said that. They just changed so, some some names, some titles, and, and languages, and it's so funny. Yeah, Doug Casey has a line that I really get a kick out of, and, and this is applicable to the uh, the revolution and the counter revolution or the legalization of cannabis out in uh, out in Colorado. He says. Uh, no, there, there's not going to be a concentration camps here in America. No, they call them something else now. Hmm. So, yeah, it, it, you know, they threw out the empire and then they created the American exceptionalism, but it's still an empire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. 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 They, so you, they, they, like I said earlier, they, cha they change the language and people just easily baffled by bullshit. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so any experiences uh, you've had? educating people or is it just all have you i mean have you ha successfully had anybody go you know what lou you're right i've had a number of people uh there, there's one more thing that i want to talk about on the on the revolution and this is probably the most important part this might be the most important thing that i'm going to say today uh when it comes to this idea of you know you get a bunch of these three percenters or a bunch of uh bunch of I don't know, Cantwellian types that, that maybe think that violent revolution is going to do it. He he was talking about that for a while, right? That yeah, violent he, he revolution is will abolish the state. And, okay. Right. Right. Stealing underpants. He or, said a lot. I don't yeah. Know. Yeah. Destroying underpants creates uh, less government. But anyway, <laughs> the whole thing is, it, and this goes back to the idea of government is sometimes good, usually legitimate, but always necessary. As long as those beliefs are in place, if you destroyed the government, if, if, if you dropped a, a nuclear bomb on Mordor on the Potomac right now, granted, there'd probably be a few people celebrating saying, that dang Muslim Obama, he's gone now. Yeah. <laughs> and the first thing that they're going to do is build a new one. Yep. And just like the winners of the violent revolution, that I described before, they're going to take steps to ensure the preservation of that new government. So until this religion of the state goes the way of Zeus and Hercules to, to where, you know, maybe they make some movies about it, but nobody's worshiping, worshiping it anymore, a violent revolution will just bring a new state, and it will most likely be worse than the one that you got rid of. Yep. Well, my my point is always that all revolutions have leaders, and I don't want a leader. Well, there's nothing well, necessarily wrong with leaders, but I'm is... I'm the only leader in my life. Oh, okay, that's okay, Dave. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good for you. It's well, like... and they're collectivist in nature. It's us versus them. Well, so I mean, and and there's a leader of the us, and uh... there's also a leader of the them, and it's us versus them, and it's oh, you know, just. It, trust me, it, it, it plays trust out. Trust you. <laughs> okay, Dave. Trust me, the math is there. This is, there. Dave, this is, how, this is how Dave wins an argument. Trust, okay, trust so, me. All right, so just, just trust me. find me one revolution that didn't have a leader then. I, okay, again, I, you're the one arguing that there's a problem with all leaders. I, I, did, I don't have a problem. Did I say that? I said that I said that I, I my my counter to your original statement was like there's not a problem with all leaders and you kept insisting your original point which meant you were challenging what I was saying. I'm not a so nihilist. Yes, you did but... say it. No, yeah. no, no, no. You were, the, the, you were hinting at absolutes again, Dave. Anyway, no, let's move well, on. All right, there's a leader on a football team. Okay, I get that. All right, that's Dave, not what I was I, saying. I, I was saying I'm... in a violent political revolution, I don't want a leader. I I'm my own leader. Okay. I think of you as a leader, Dave. A leader of what? <laughs> Cola? What? <laughs> Jeremy got it. A leader. <laughs> yeah. No, but anyway, as far as my experiences, uh, uh, talking to people and trying to educate and trying to create some revolution, yeah, there's, there's been plenty of them out there. Uh, it, it matters if the person is ready to receive the message. We were talking about the Matrix before the before the show even started, and when you look at uh, you know Morpheus going around freeing minds, and then you know eventually in the later episodes, which you guys don't like, would, but I appreciate, uh, you know more or Neo's going out freeing minds and everything else. Uh, but in the first one, Morpheus is saying that these people are so attached to the matrix that they will fight to defend it to the, you know, to their own death because I mean, that's how, that's how they are. And, and there are people out there that are like that, but you can take a certain event and talk to somebody. I think one-on-one -on -one works a little bit better, but you could just point at that and say, look at that. 
what do you think what do you think happened there and if it's something that resonates with them you know because i've seen people that are they're very anti-drug but they've seen the violence of the drug war and it's, it's really turned their hearts um I had heard something. I, I don't know how true it is. Uh, I wasn't around at the time, but I have heard that part of the turning point in the civil rights movement was when black protesters you know, were marching, and here they are, you know, nicely dressed. And they, 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 they don't look like they're out of a rap video. So here you have nicely dressed people, suit and tie dresses, hats, and you know, white gloves, and all sort of stuff. And the cops are sicking the dogs on these people. Mm-hmm. And all all they want to do is ride the bus without getting sent to the back. They they just want to go in and and eat lunch at the at the counter without having to order out of the out of the back door. They want to, you know, be treated like human beings. Yeah. And and when people saw the cops sicking the dogs on those folks, that was a turning point. Now I don't know how true it is. It, it it makes sense. It sounds plausible to me. But if you look at the backlash against the cops, you know, groups like Cop Block exist because cops are thugs. Mm. And when groups like Cop Block expose the thuggery, or photography is not a crime, or police the police, you know, any of these different groups, they're they're putting this out there. And there's a lot of people that used to be staunch supporters of the police that, when they look at something. And they can no longer have that that blind faith and obedience to support the local police, or even more when they've had an experience themselves. Now, a, a Facebook friend of mine, he's you know one of these conservative, uh, you know, hump, humping the blue line types. You know, he was recently in court, and you know he's bitching about you know how the how the cop you know got something wrong or something like that. I says, well, you did, you know, after he lied on you, you thanked him for his service, right? (laughs) And I, sometimes it's just something like that. And, and I really love memes because the memes point out the cognitive dissonance and things. Mm -hmm. And you'll be surprised how often that image might resonate with somebody. Yeah, you're right. I, th- there, there's one that I made up. It was right after the Supreme Court uh, opinion on gay marriage, mm. and it was uh, it was three cops in riot gear. One's hosing a a kid down with uh, industrial strength or industrial sized can of uh, of pepper spray. Another guy's got a big old baton. Another guy's got it looks like a like a revolver shotgun, but it's for like beanbag rounds. Mm. Anyway. The, the caption that I put on there was bake the fucking cake because ultimately <laughs> because all laws are enforced at the barrel of a gun. Mm-hmm. And you would be surprised the number of Christian conservative friends of mine that shared that. Mm-hmm. You know, and they put up captions like, you know, please forgive the language. But and I said, you know what? The, la- the language is the least offensive part of this mm-hmm. because ultimately – all, all laws are enforced at the barrel of a gun. And it could have gone the other way. It could have been the, the cops beating up the kids saying, no, you can't get married. Yep. Yeah. And, and once people can see this, and once you have a heart-to-heart talk with them, and you have touched their crazy cat spot that, that gets their leg kicking, and they start thinking, and they, and they quit with their, you know, it's it's like if you're having a conversation about something and they're just looking for a place to throw in Obama's a Muslim, <laughs> or or a liberal waiting to throw in uh, those damn Koch brothers. Yep. Yeah, you got to get them away from that. You know, like hey, this isn't a political discussion. You know, I want you to use your mind. Don't don't you know, don't use the bumper sticker you saw. <laughs> yeah, use the yeah. meme that I put up. <laughs> <laughs> Memes are the bumper sticker of the future, huh? It. Memes are the bumper stickers traveling up and down the information superhighway. The yep. digital bumper sticker. <laughs> so, uh, last question, then we'll wrap up. Uh, John asks, do you think there's any chance for redeeming the millennials, or have you completely given up hope? You yourself aren't really a millennial, so I would... So I fuck know. them, no. <laughs> uh, no, no I'm, I'm 45. Uh, you, you know, have, have you guys talked to my co-host Nick Hazelton? No, the the the, the yak farmer is that the yeah, guy? Yeah, okay. yeah. No, I haven't talked to him. Yet. 
Okay, you guys should. I, he, he's a real fun guy to talk to. He's 16, probably close to 17 right now. Well, as the young, fresh uh, guy in the room here, I, I'll see if I can get him on. You know, Danilo and Jeremy, they're old. <clears throat> they're old as hell, so. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll put in the word for you guys, but yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> when I talk to him, you know, I, I have some hope. But there's just so many others out there that it's like, Oh my God! How did you make it this far in life? How did you not get? <laughs> how did you not get run over like a possum on the highway? <laughs> Seriously, it, and, and I think it's that way with all generations. Uh, I do think that a lot of this younger generation is is really buying into the socialism, but but they get that at the in, government indoctrination gulag, and I think maybe is it is a result of here in the USSA every you know. Things have been a lot easier than in the third world, or e- even in even in you know the modern world of Europe. There, I, think, I, mean, I think a lot of people uh, in the millennial age group they don't understand because like you can pull them. What do you think about like rank socialism one to a hundred? And they're like sixty. I think it's all right. And then you ask them about free markets, and they'll be like eighty. Free markets are rule, but they don't understand that those are two. Like they the the idea that is implanted into their brains of what socialism is isn't what socialism is like they think that social action or getting the government to force a certain thing that's socialism they they don't realize that socialism is government ownership of the means of production mm-hmm. yeah, yeah well, well I, they they see the the bernie sanders warm and fuzzy campaign promise you know kind of like the constitution humpers go with the campaign promise of the federalist papers you know if you like your freedom you can keep your freedom yep <laughs> Yeah, so well, uh, I was just going to say the uh, I mean, they these people don't um, th- they can't see past the, the, the their own, I don't know, ignorance, <laughs> uh, yeah. which is part of the problem. But it, it, I think this second question actually ties back to the last one, too, because, you know, for every win you have for every person you come across and you have that personal experience where you can show them and that's what wakes them up. It, 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 that helps a lot when you have a personal interaction with it, then you can see it on that level. Um, but the, you're like, you're fighting upstream constantly because for every one, there's just more and more people, more and more younger people getting churned out in the system that's still being perpetuated. So now we, we reach a point where these past couple of generations are totally oblivious to not just the failings, but the, you know, the human suffrage of, um, from, you know, suffering rather from, uh, from and, socialism and communism and all this, you know, for, and just, human just, suffrage. Well, yeah, that, yeah, exactly. And human suffrage. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm all for that. Well, well, um, well here, here's a, here's a solution for it. And Danilo, you've been rather quiet and you know, we haven't spoken too much before. How did you, how did you, become an anarchist voluntarist libertarian abolitionist you know whatever whatever you want to mm-hmm. call yourself how, how did you fall into that Woo. oh that's a long story <laughs> um i mean I, I was always interested in uh philosophy uh in high school and then you know into uh, holistic medicine and was learning about monsanto and then that led into you know learning about the corporate fascism and then then i i stumbled upon a uh, creature from jekyll island and uh and Dollar Vigilante, Anarchist, and Stefan Molyneux, because you know I have kids, so the peaceful parenting part. So and then slowly, you know, a lot of reading Rothbard and and uh, and Larkin Rose and a few other people. So yeah. yeah. Okay. So so let me summarize it for you. Would it be safe to say that you found that the state was a losing proposition? There's no way to make it a winning proposition, and the the whole thing is just a mess, and and you and you can't make it good. Would that be yeah. a good summary? Okay. Yeah. So, so ultimately, it, it sounds like there were multiple things that they got you on, on your way. Uh, can you think of any one particular thing that made you start questioning the religion of statism? Yeah, I, I wasn't really ever a statist. I, I was indifferent towards politics. I didn't care. It didn't uh, affect good for me. You. Yeah, I didn't really care about it. You know, I, I voted for Obama in 2008 because my family is Democrat, and they're like, you know, you should vote. I'm like, all right, who should I vote for? Obama. All right, I'll vote for Obama. So I didn't really and, care about it. And vote as, harder, too. Yeah, I didn't really care about it at all. Mm-hmm. And then I, I think I, I, there's a quote I remember reading that um, 
you know, politics, everybody's bored by politics, like, or, or by learning about the government because they don't understand it. It's all, you know, all these laws and taxes, but they just, they're just driven to boredom until you actually study it and you realize the violence and the gun in the room. Then it's not boring because then you understand what's, what's really going on, what's behind, you know, the theft and coercion. <laughs> but, but until then, it's obscure and it's a fog for most people. Yeah. Now, moving on to Jeremy, uh, when, when you decide that the state wasn't a winning proposition, or even when you started to, started to question it, was there one particular thing that was a catalyst for you? Um, yeah, well, I mean, me, for mine, I just, I, I, I liked history, so I actually started digging deeper, and I think it was, I think I actually said, I think I answered a question similar to this on our, our web page, or on our Facebook page mm -hmm. yesterday, it was the Whiskey Rebellion, and, uh, and then, yeah, that's what that's that was the catalyst. That that okay. that reading about that event and then digging deeper and and taking it from there was what all of a sudden was like, wait a minute, what this constitution isn't what I thought it was. <laughs> <That's> yeah. <actually. laughs> and how, and how about you, Dave? I, I'm one of those people that like if I hear a word, and I don't know anything about it, like I spend like the fascism. Next, yeah, I, I spend like the next week like reading everything I can about it. And you know, I was just uh, you know, I I was in the tea I was in the tea party thing. I was speaking at tea party events. I was doing and I, you know, I would I was finding out that some of the stuff I was saying was just so conflicting for these people to even think about. And you know, I was just I, I kind of got pushed out uh, by some of them. And mm -hmm. you know, I just, I, I kind of swung into an apolitical situation, kind of like Danilo there, where I was just like, you know what, the system there, there's nothing I can do about it. No change is gonna happen. Fuck it, I'm done. And I gave up, and you know, I was just like, "Hey, I'm just gonna just do whatever." And um, uh, really like wrestling, and uh, listen to wrestling podcasts. And Roddy Roddy Piper, rest in peace. Uh, he uh, he had Adam Kokesh on out of fucking nowhere, and uh, listening to Adam Kokesh talk, I mean, he was saying words I haven't heard before. He was talking, and I was like, "I've got to do all this research now." <laughs> this fucking asshole gets on here, and I've got to hear. I got now. Now I gotta, I gotta look up. I gotta think now. I gotta words. Look, I gotta look up voluntarism. I gotta look up anarchy. I gotta look up cognitive dissonance. I gotta read Rothbard. <laughs> so like the next the next day, I'm I'm listening to Four New Liberty on audiobook, and I'm like, holy shit! I agree with fucking everything this guy says. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, this is like th this is what I've wanted to tell the Tea Party guys the whole time. I just didn't know what to say, and it is it, it was. It was just that simple, per chance, listening to Adam Kokesh talk for a few minutes. So ultimately, we have the. But I'm a rational thinker, so I don't. Okay. Except for when it comes to, uh, <laughs> I, so like, so like, I like even like when like someone is debating me, I never, I always come from a place of ration, even if it was within the status paradigm. <laughs> well, when Bernie's president, you'll be rationing them again too. <laughs> hey, uh, no, a vote for but... Bur uh, bread lines for the future. Yeah, but but here's here's the thing. We all have the same story, but we all have a different story. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we took a different path, but ultimately, the the four of us, probably a vast majority of your listeners, and probably a vast majority of the folks in the Facebook group, we all found the state to be intolerable. Mm -hmm. We all found it to be something that can no longer exist. We, we can't fit into that paradigm. It's, it's, it's like uh, Neo coming out of the Matrix and not being able to go back in. You know, because, you know, how do you go back in? How do you unlearn, unlearn what you have learned? Well, Cypher tried to do it, so I don't know. Well, he was a douche. <laughs> don't be a Cypher. Don't yeah. be a Cypher. Don't, <laughs> don't, so, run, for, don't run for a politician. <laughs> yeah. So when people come to the conclusion and I, I think the numbers are growing a lot quicker now than they were 10, 20, 30 years ago. And I talked about this on the last podcast and Ben Stone, Bag Quakers talked about this too. The increase in tyranny is actually creating a greater demand for liberty. And the worse that the state gets, the more people walk away from it. I mean, hell, I used to be a, I used to be a neocon 
and I'm just a hardcore status, and I believed, you know, that the government needed to do what it needed to do. Shut up and don't ask questions. And you used to hate bacon too. I, it was you were just a weird dude, man. I have never heard. I have never hated bacon. I recorded the <laughs> Skype conversation when you admitted that you made it up. So oh, knock it, knock it off with that crap. Got you, here bitch. We, here we go with the recording. All right, all right, all right. You caught me red-handed. But are you Nixon here? I th- you were taping without permission. Well, actually, I didn't record, but I just got you to admit to it. Oh, oh shit! Oh, man. The reverse psychology guy. I am, I am never robbing a bank with you. You'll fall, <laughs> fall under questioning. But actually, here in USSA, bank robs you. So, <laughs> anyway, so with, with the number of people that are, that are finding the state intolerable and walking away, I see the only way for this to end is for it to get bad enough to where enough people have had enough that they walk away. And I, it's, how can I put it? If, if you look at the end of prohibition of alcohol, it, it wasn't because FDR wanted to return liberty to, to the people. It wasn't because, you know, they realized that they had, you know, maybe they made a mistake and all this other stuff. The fact is that, a couple of years after prohibition was implemented, more people were consuming alcohol than before. More alcohol was being consumed. It, it, it's like they banned it and and they put fertilizer on drinking. I knew it was just everywhere. And what really ultimately killed prohibition was when people were nullifying at trial, jury nullification. Mm-hmm. So. They found that it was unenforceable. In an effort to save face, they said, "Okay, you know, we're going to, you know, repeal prohibition. We're go- we're going to restore liberty. You know, hey, we tried this; it didn't work out like it should have." And and then, of course, they immediately banned uh, cannabis like a year or two later. Mm-hmm. But in gold, yeah, yeah, in <laughs> gold. But it, if you if you look at what is going on with with uh, cannabis right now. The war on drugs is dying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if, if, if you look at really how tyrannical things got when, when uh, gold was banned, you know, all right, the average liberal today, they don't care about gold, but they do care about their, uh, about their organic food. They care about being able to get raw milk. They care about being able to go to the organic garden and, and buy the stuff and the way that the USDA and Department of Fish and Hogs in the different states are cracking down on these small local farmers that, that's getting at the at the liberals and of course they love they love their pot legalization and all this other stuff but also when you look at all the new gun stuff that's coming out and the conservatives don't like that and and you know just all these different things Everybody is getting the shaft right now, and it's getting to a point to where there's an anger. And if you can talk to people and redirect that anger where it belongs, instead of you know having you know that conservative say that dang Muslim Obama, you know, he's a okay. socialist with stinky feet. He's, he's a liar, a socialist, and his feet stink. Well, <laughs> same with Romney. It, I mean, if, if you can. I, sometimes you have to get in their face and, and say, look at this, look at this. They're twins. And sometimes you can reach them, sometimes you can't. But the worse <laughs> that the state gets, the more it clamps down, the more it makes life miserable for people, the more likely people are to walk away. Once they realize that, no, getting back to the Constitution isn't going to do anything and getting the right people in charge isn't going to work because it's never freaking happened. Now. That's how you do it. And as far as doing it incrementally, personally, I would rather see a rapid collapse. I would rather see it it go in like a day rather than over a hundred years like the collapse of Rome. Hmm. And, and the reason being is once you have the collapse, once you hit the bottom, that's when you can actually start recovery. Yep. Hmm. Now, if, if you look at an earthquake or a, or a hurricane or something like that, Granted, yeah, you got a bunch of domesticated house pets that are waiting, waiting for the FEMA trucks to come in and, and mm-hmm. provide relief and everything. You know, and you got all these anti-capitalist Democrats saying, screw that Walmart truck and that one and that one and that one. I'm going to wait five days for FEMA to get here. <laughs> you know, 
Right. Ultimately, when people realize that you know FEMA is not coming, the government is not going to help them, and that they have to save themselves, that they have to help themselves, that they have to stand on their own two feet, they they really do. And I and I think that huma- humans as a whole have a lot of resilience. Unfortunately, I I, I think that humans also have a, a lot of laziness, and they will they will quickly become complacent when they're allowed to. So I think if there's a, if the stake is really horrible and there's a big ass collapse, and unfortunately I don't think there's going to be a hell of a lot of survivors when it happens. I you know Ho- I don't hopefully think so. they, hopefully they won't be stupid enough to build a new one. <laughs> I don't know. We've never had like a full blown situation like uh, World War II or the fall of Rome or the British Empire shit in the bed with the internet. And the internet is such a great game changer to human life. You know, it's, I mean, a cop shoots a kid in Ohio 20 years ago. That would have been local news in Ohio that a kid with a fake gun got accidentally shot. Now it was world worldwide news and the fucking cops are, their houses get fucking protested at constantly. And everybody knows the cops' social security numbers because hackers hacked them. So it's like, you know, the internet changes everything. It, it, it does, but, all right, let me throw a scenario at you. And, and I don't know how likely this is, but uh, do you know what a fence post turtle is? A fence post turtle? Yeah. No. I th- oh, I think yeah. I, I, I think I saw the picture of the turtle on top of the fence. Like, yeah, you, 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 you see a turtle up on, up on right. the top of a fence post. Like, how right. did it get there? Yeah, you have no idea how it got up there. You know it doesn't belong there, but it's there. Okay. <laughs> Most politicians are fence post turtles. So when you're looking at... <laughs> When, when you're looking at the volatility of the Middle East right now, and particularly with the Russians involved in the, in Syria, do you think that it's possible that fence post turtles on either side could do something stupid that sparked off World War III? Yes. Okay, sure. But yeah. here's the thing. I think if a, like the, the only way I see a world war happening at this point is nuclear war. And I don't think, I mean, because politicians' families would be affected and stuff, it's always, you always have to consider when, whenever families of politicians are going to be involved, uh, war seems to somehow get pushed down and let's let cooler heads uh, prevail. But like a flagged uh, naval battle between U.S. and China, that ain't going to happen because either side starts losing, they're, they're sending the nukes. So, well, I mean, maybe, maybe not. You know, I, what it is, it's never underestimate the power of stupidity. I, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm just saying that, you know, like false flags, like how many people when the Gulf of Tonkin happened didn't like thought immediately thought in their head, wow, this is a false flag. Like now 9-11 happened in 2001. That shit popped up faster than I've ever heard in my life. Wait, wait a second. There's this is bullshit. The whole thing's bullshit. Something's up. And, you know, four years, three years later, they invade Iraq. And Afghanistan. Three years. So still two, year, two, two years. Two years. All right. Maybe a year and a half. Okay. Yeah, so, it, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So why not? Why, you know, so it's like all bullshit, the whole thing. And, you know, I, I said the other day, you know, I, I, mark my words, a false flag by ISIS will happen on U.S. soil. And they're going to, they're not going to, the intended outcome is not going to happen that the fascists want. Oh, well, you never know. I, because they, you know, as we talked about earlier, crisis, it, you know, never let a crisis go to waste, you know, especially if you worked really hard to create it. Yeah, but uh, they have it. They have it. They have at least three or four scenarios. They have at least three or four yeah. scenarios played out for everything. So but 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 here's the thing. You have a lot of people that will absolutely positively freak out if there's an attack, e- even mm-hmm. if even if it actually was a false flag there are people that will panic because scared people get desperate and desperate people do stupid stuff like put faith in the government mm-hmm. well, exactly and you know uh, james one of my friends james on 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 facebook posted something about the 28 pages that they're wanting to release and i'm like what what happens when it comes out and it's like yeah the government did 9 11 what, what are the people going to revolt stop paying taxes no they're not they're going to sit quietly and go oh well that was george bush it wasn't Obama. 
You know what? It's gonna be like it's gonna be like the season finale episode of the X Files, to where it comes so close to actually, you know, showing something, and then you know, boom, go to commercial, come back, and it's nothing. Hmm. That smoking yeah. man is still alive, so I don't know. <laughs> well, he didn't smoke regular cigarettes. He smoked like some sort of cloves. But I, I'm I'm just saying. You know, a lot of people will it's panic and, and they'll and they'll get on board. I mean, even Ben Stone said that right after nine eleven, he jumped on the bad wagon for a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know, and also uh, here's something else that's kind of unrelated to nine eleven or any type of attack. But you know, all my life growing up, Richard Nixon was absolutely demonized as being lower than pond scum. But when he died, you know, it was almost like he was deified. Yeah. You know, you had you had all these people, his his former political enemies, coming out and saying such nice things about him. You know, I it, if something were to happen to Obama, do you, you know how many how many Republicans do you really think would be celebrating, and how many people would be like, we gotta get those Muslims for killing our Muslim? <laughs> mm-hmm. That yeah, that that sure has a funny way of uh, deifying people. <laughs> yeah, but but that's the whole religion of statism. You know, they they hate Obama until they don't hate him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and if if they're in a panic, you know, like I let, let, let's say that there was an ISIS attack on the on the White House or something like that. You know, these Tea Party patriots would freak out. You know, maybe they don't give two shits about Obama. Maybe they maybe they care more about the building. More, maybe they care more about the symbolism of the of the office or what whatever it is. But they're going to freak out. Mm-hmm. Of course. So. Because my nation. Yeah. <laughs> but what you're looking at is never underestimate the power of stupidity and the the links that people will go to to participate in a lie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, how is it going to collapse? I don't know. But bottom line is I hope it happens quickly so that people can start the recovery rather than having a long collapse. It, it, it's kind of like mental health. Uh, if, if you have somebody that's a drug addict and homeless, you know, they have this idea, well, all I got to do is get a new job or all I got to do is get a new place or maybe I need to move out of here and get away from this hood. Well, you go get a new job, you go get a new place, maybe you move to a different city, but you haven't escaped the real problem, and that's you. Mm-hmm. Because you are a drug addict or you have a mental illness. Mm-hmm. And that is what brought you to the particular place that you are. So until people get sick and tired of the state and start looking for alternatives, you know, I, I think Obamacare is a great thing because it's actually going to get conservatives to embrace black markets. Because mm-hmm. eventually they're going to have to go to the black market to get their medication and get their medical care. Now, if, well, if Hillary, all it's going to take is the Uber app for medical care. Yeah, if, so, if, yeah. Hil- if Hillary wants to have her mandatory buybacks, I tell you what, good, go ahead. You know, I'm, I'm sure they can start producing ghost gunner machines left and freaking right. <laughs> and you know, I, I, I've, I've even got some of the some of the conservatives agreeing with me on this, saying, well, you know, hey, Cody Wilson, he's done more to preserve gun ownership than the Second Amendment, the NRA, and, and every protester waving the government's flag combined. Yep. So. Absolutely. Well, Danilo, wrap us hey, up. Thank you very much, Lou, uh, for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Um, great uh, conversation on incre- incrementalism. And uh, why it is amongst one of the many status mythologies that we will we will hear. <laughs> uh, if you want to, you think you're gonna you know change change hell? Why don't you change, go to hell and change it from the inside? One of my favorite memes. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, thanks a lot, Lou. Wonderful conversation. That's thanks it. for thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to talk to you guys, and it's nice to finally meet and talk to you for the first time, Danilo, uh, Jeremy, Dave. You guys are awesome. Oh, thanks, uh, though, man. And, and, and you this can always a, check out Lou on Wednesday, right? Wednesday nights on the when, Freedom Fiends? Wednesday night on the Freedom Fiends. Uh, you can stream it on LRN.FM, GCN Live, or you can go to FreedomFiends.com and download the po- podcast with reduced commercials. Awesome. I, yeah, I love it. Yep. I know Jeremy does, too. He got yeah. he got me on to the he got me hooked onto the show. <laughs> yeah, Jeremy, was... Jeremy got excited listening to the Fiends today. <laughs> I, I did too. I, I was driving. I was yeah. I was listening at the time, and you said it. I'm like, all right. Um, yeah, I know. I've I've said it before. I said it the last time we were on. I said it when we had Ben on. I I started 
listening, I don't know, I guess somewhere around like the late 500s in the episodes, and uh, I don't think I've missed an episode since. Um, I was I was probably happier that you posted that picture than you were in that picture. Because I was like, oh, wow, I touched somebody properly. Yeah, Randy was cracking me up. He goes, so how do I listen to this Seeds of Liberty thing? <laughs> Yeah, that was funny. So, yeah. uh, uh, new Patreon, uh, Dustin, thank you so much for your pledge. I uh, really appreciate it. And thank you to all of our other Patreon uh, pledges. That, that really helps us uh, pay for hosting costs. Yes, please. If you want to help us continue doing this uh, for Liberty, please donate um, <clears throat> uh, Bitcoin Patreon. We accept uh, any form of payment you can uh, send through the mail. You want to try. I don't want to suggest it, but you can try. <laughs> also, yeah. please comment, like, share, subscribe. Our show, to our shows you'll uh, so you can keep up to date with what we're doing and uh, help us spread the word. So uh, thanks a lot, everyone. Uh, wonderful conversation. So this is uh, Seeds Liberty Podcast. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Worms? Nice. Question mark? Worms? Worms. Worms. Worms.